Um, so, hello everyone. Um, my name is Oliver Kirsebaum and I'm the senior staff scientist on the Meridian Project. And on behalf of the team, I'd like to welcome you to this fifth web webinar um, event in a series of seven webinars that we're hosting this winter. Um, Meridian is a three-year project funded by the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Uh, we also receive support from the member universities, which include Dalhousie, Université du Québec, SFU, UBC, and UVic. And we also have uh, a number of industry partners, notably JASCO and Exact Earth. This webinar series in particular is funded by a grant from Fisheries and Oceans Canada under the Ocean and Freshwater uh, Science Contribution Program. And also I should like to thank uh, Pisces Research Project Management, Kess, Kieran, and their team for their awesome help with preparing and running these uh, webinars. At Meridian, our mandate uh, the last few years has been to support the ocean research community through the creation of software tools for managing, analyzing, and visualizing underwater acoustics data. And so as part of this webinar series, uh, we're showcasing some of the, the work that we've done in the last few years, among other things. Today's webinar has uh, the short title, Edge Computing for Hydrophones, and it also has the slightly longer title, Machine Learning for in situ automated analysis of underwater acoustics data. And to shed light on this exciting topic, we are joined by a rather impressive list of speakers, which I will bring up here. In fact, uh, when we started reaching out uh, to potential speakers for today's event, uh, the response we received was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and some of the people we contacted even suggested additional speakers for us to approach. And so that's how we ended up with this rather dense program, which features uh, seven presentations. And we'll try to get through this in the next three hours or so. We have 25 minutes allotted for each presentation, uh, but be aware that this includes time for questions. Uh, so if you can keep your presentation a little shorter than 25 minutes, uh, that'd be great. Um, for the audience, you can ask questions at the end, either by unmuting yourself or by using the chat. Uh, if you're using the chat, you can also ask questions during the presentation and we'll come back to them at the end of the presentation if there's time. Uh, and of course, you're also welcome to use the chat for not just for questions, but for comments. Uh, um, for instance, uh, in relation to questions asked by other um, in the audience. I should also mention before we get going that the webinar will be recorded and the video will be made available uh, through our YouTube channel um, within the next week or so. And if you go to our YouTube channel, um, you will also find recordings of the previous webinar events. And so without further ado, let me pass the microphone to uh, the first uh, presenters of today's event, uh, Hilary Morse Murphy and Harold York. Uh, both from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and they will be giving a joint presentation entitled Research and Conservation of Whales Needs Near Real-Time Acoustic Monitoring, a DFO Science Perspective. And so, uh, Hilary and Harald, you're welcome to share your screen now and see if we can bring your slides Perfect. up for everyone to see. So, can you see my slides there? Not yet. Oh, hang on. Let's try this. Excellent. Yep. Perfect. Um, well, thank you uh, for inviting Harold and I to speak during this talk, um, this series today. And what we really wanted to do is give a bit of a DFO perspective on um, research and conservation needs for whales um, in terms of near real-time monitoring needs. Hang on, bear with me. Okay, there we go. So um, as a brief introduction, passive acoustic monitoring or PAM is being used by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans for a wide variety of research monitoring and management activities. Um, many, most of these um, that I'm talking about are 
focused on increasing our understanding of how whales are using our waters. Um, and they're also in place to support better protection for whales in Canadian waters. Uh, the, the kind of efforts I'm talking about include long-term PARAM efforts, um, and these kind of efforts provide information on the occurrence and behavior of whales over various spatial and temporal scales, um, some very long uh, temporal scale, scales in some cases, and it's being used to assist in assessing risk to whales in our waters and developing measures to mitigate threats. Near real-time PAM efforts, such as detection and classification of whale calls over shorter time frames, can provide information on species presence within a general area over much shorter time scales, such as within the past few hours or uh, the last couple of days. And this kind of near real-time monitoring effort is being used to support implementation of management actions over shorter time scales of scales of uh, hours to days to weeks. And then we have um, actual like real time PM efforts. Um, and this might include acoustically tracking animals in real time and provides information on the current location of individuals within a given area. And this kind of PAM effort, um, it is being used to support implementation of more immediate mitigation measures and actions to avoid or reduce impacts to marine mammals over time scales that are much shorter of like minutes um, to hours within our waters. So, hang on a sec while I advance here. Um, can you see my next slide just to make sure it advanced online? Perfect. Yep. Yep. Um, so I, I know we were going to talk about in-situ monitoring, but uh, I didn't want to lose this thought. And that's that um, we've been using archival recorders uh, within DFO, up Eastern and Western Canada and up North um, for many years. And just as an example, this map shows the number of years of acoustic recordings collected from sites off Nova Scotia by DFO Maritimes region specifically. So it doesn't include all of the PAM acoustic efforts Yvonne has been doing up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Quebec or Jack Lawson's Newfoundland efforts. Um, and it also doesn't include the efforts from groups outside of DFO in these areas. So this is just an example of uh, what my team at DFO has been collecting. And um, my point being that we have many years of acoustic data. Our efforts began back in 2012. And in this map, the, the bigger the circle, the more years of recording effort um, that is represented at a given site. And so our PAM effort has grown from just under a thousand recording days per year in the 2012 to 2013 period to more than 3,000 recording days per year um, in our latest batch of data that came in in the 2018 to 2019 data. Um, so we're collecting a lot of acoustic data, um, not necessarily in real time or near real time, um, even on these archival recorders. And such long-term and archival PAM data, it is very important and it's being used to address a variety of um, even basic biology questions and management questions. For example, to assess species presence, distribution, movement patterns and habitat use. Um, we use it to increase understanding of seasonal and annual variability and occurrence to help identify important habitats such as potential new critical habitat for species. And we recently did this um, in a, uh, in a 2019 CSAS process for northern bottlenose whales. And I have that SAR document pictured um, on the left. So we were using long-term passive acoustic monitoring to build a case that there's additional important habitat for the species um, that has yet to be identified as critical habitat. Um, we monitor impacts such as uh, changes in acoustic behavior that are associated with um, different human activities. Um, we can use this kind of data to help us develop mitigation measures for human activities occurring in and near cetacean habitats. We can inform marine spatial planning activities, species at risk recovery measures, and more. I think I missed a slide here. Um, so one of the issues um, with this kind of 
uh, monitoring, is, it goes back to the big data problem. Um, and it's a good problem to have. And that's that lots of data are being collected that are associated with these PAM efforts. Um, automated detection and classification algorithms are applied to help process the data. Um, but all of that data processing, um, it still requires some level of manual effort to validate the data. And we need to have some level of confidence that the results we have are real and that we understand how detectors are performing. So our current bottlenecks um, when it comes to this kind of archival data are on the personnel side. So we have lots and lots of data, but not enough people or time to process it and use it to its full potential. So um, right now in our region, um, we're spending a lot of time just coming up with um, basic daily presence of animals, but there's so much more we could be doing with these data sets. Um, and that's because we have to do a lot of validation on them. So there is there is a need for reliable and efficient analysis tools and a need to understand the performance of those tools under varying conditions. So I just didn't want to lose the thought that this is a big part of our acoustic monitoring and um, AI and neural network uh, kind of detectors will also be important for this. And uh, we should keep that in mind, even though right now in this webinar, we're gonna be talking a lot more about uh, near real time or in situ analysis. So in terms of our near real time efforts that um, I just wanted to touch base on, uh, PAM detections are being used to support both static and dynamic management actions to reduce human impacts of uh, impacts of human activities in Canada. And I'm going to give some examples, particularly from the eastern um, eastern coast. And my examples are all related to what we're doing um, to help mitigate human activities um, and impacts on North Atlantic right whales. So we are using some near real-time monitoring um, to do this. And the current platforms that have been incorporated into this, these near real-time management activities include Viking buoys that have been equipped with acoustic recorders. And I believe Yvonne Smart is on this, uh, this seminar and he can probably answer any of the more technical questions about this kind of system since he's the lead for that project. Um, and slocum gliders with PAM packages have also been feeding information into this uh, management scheme. And the leads for those efforts include Chris Taggart of Dalhousie University and Kim Davies of the University of New Brunswick, St. John. Uh, however, I note that Adam Camo um, is also next up on the speaker list and, and he'll be talking about these slocum glider packages and how, they'll be, how they're being used. Um, this map here on the right was taken from an online platform called the Whale Map, um, hosted by Dalhousie University, and it shows the right whale acoustic detections from slocum gliders in the blue tracks, as well as Viking buoys, which are represented as gray circles, in July and August of 2020. And the red circles indicate definite North Atlantic right whale acoustic detections, um, and these are confirmed by acoustic analysts. And the yellow circles indicate possible acoustic detections of right whales. And how it's set up to work is that um, these platforms collect acoustic data um, and they're equipped with onboard processors that detect and classify right whale calls and other call and calls of other species in some cases as well. The process data is then sent to shore via some kind of remote communication. And then an analyst reviews and validates or confirms all the detections um, on there at least once per day. And any of those, any false detections are removed. Um, the definite and, and in some cases, the possible detections are uploaded onto whale map. And each morning whale map auto generates a report that highlights any new confirmed visual or acoustic detections. And it sends those to managers within DFO as well as Transfer Canada. And the managers determine if the detections meet the requirements to implement management actions such as fisheries closures or dynamic slowdowns. Um, and I'm just noting that this is a really greatly simplified view of what's going on. Uh, there's a lot more steps involved here. Um, but, uh, and if you want sort of all the details around exactly what are those management actions and how are they implemented and um, that, that's really what we, um, those questions should really go to managers. Um, but
But what I wanted to note is that uh, for fisheries closures, uh, fishermen are given a period of time to remove gear from an area and the closures will remain in place for some period of time, usually about two weeks uh, or until an area can be cleared of whales and areas are cleared of whales based on aerial surveys, uh, at least one, maybe a couple of aerial surveys um, in order to clear an area. And for vessel slowdown, the speed restrictions are put in place uh, generally for a, a two week period or until an area can be cleared of whales. And I wanted to point out that uh, we do have some great examples of um, how acoustic detections alone have been used on the East Coast to um, implement and management action. Um, so as an example of this, there were several definite right whale calls detected in Roseway Basin in a right whale critical habitat from a silicone glider in November 2020. And it actually resulted in a fisheries closure. So there were no visual sightings associated with this acoustic detection, but um, we, we treated that acoustic detection just like a visual detection. And part of that Roseway Basin area was closed as a result of that um, to fishing. Um, so just to summarize some of these near real-time monitoring efforts and needs that I brought up here, um, the management actions that I'm talking about on the east coast of Canada, uh, they happen over periods of hours to days. So decisions, um, you know, they get made within hours or days of a detection. And because detections may be associated with management actions um, that cost time and money, uh, our managers want a high level of confidence it, that the detections are real, that they, they are validated and confirmed, and they are definite um, evidence of that species being present. So reliable and more efficient analysis tools would definitely enhance these uh, current near real-time PAM efforts. Um, but I do know that it is important for us to understand the performance of any tools that are developed and to be able to explain this to managers. Um, we need to know when uh, when these tools work and when they work well, when they don't work well, and we need to have a good understanding of any caveats or limitations associated with them so we can use them appropriately. So with that, I'm gonna hand it on to Harold um, to go over some of the real-time monitoring efforts and needs but th thanks, thanks, Lori. Uh, it was great. That was a great introduction. Just to to add, I mean, on the Pacific Coast, um, we uh, uh, there's there's long term monitoring uh, activities as well in place, and we're also trying to do the near real term one. But but as as Hillary already pointed out, on and all the the whole um, uh, presentation is organized. Is t time is is the big factor here. Um, and that is due to the fact that um, as DFO scientists, we, we have sort of a dual role. We, we on one hand, we, we need to provide information about the species, about the populations. At the same time, we also need to um, provide on-time advice for management actions. Uh, that's, our, that's part of our job. And uh, that means in some places we need to develop uh, effective means of testing tools to, to monitor um, whales. And, and that's, that's, that's a big part of our job as well because um, whale detection and tracking systems will be used and can be used for risk mitigation. Um, that is either done by, by external uh, partners, but also by our own management folks and by other departments within the government of Canada, for example, uh, oil spill response lies within the jurisdiction of um, uh, the Canadian Coast Guard, but also DFO. And one of the reasons why we need to have effective monitoring means is to reduce the risk of whales entering actually contaminated areas. And that means we need to have some sort of real-time tool that can tell us where the whales are uh, within uh, a, a specific hour and where they're going to be within the next couple of hours in order to, um, to uh, uh, start management uh, actions to try to uh, keep them out of an area. The other part is um, Transport Canada is very interested in, in ideas of um, alerting ships of whale presence to reduce the risk of uh, the physical dis uh, disturbance or the ship strike risk of these animals in real time. Uh, so that would be, or at least near real time, 
uh, to to alert uh, mariners of the presence. Uh, the same thing uh, again, Transport Canada would be one of those um, departments that would like to or does implement areas uh, where they don't want vessels to go because um, whales would be using this particular area to um, uh, for foraging or for other uh, critical needs. And uh, then the, the question is, how do we monitor that the whales are actually going to be there in those areas? And also, how do we monitor whether vessels and especially small vessels are going into those areas? So those are, those are two functions. Um, then bigger ones is the um, uh, the the, uh, the vessel and the whale activity and what what um, what are called biological sanctuaries. Those are uh, put in place, like for example, marine protected areas. How do we monitor those areas? How do we monitor its compliance with that um, uh, by by mariners with um, with the, uh, the, the the management uh, guidelines that are in place? And last not least, and I think there, there's also today some people talking maybe about that a little bit more, is uh, how do we monitor safety zones around um, loud noise producing activities such as seismic surveys, uh, military sonar exercises, pile driving activities, et cetera. Um, uh, those, are, those are important things that require uh, immediate um, needs to, um, to, to determine where the whales are, how far are they away from, from the noise source, where do they going to be moving, uh, is it an area that is highly important for them for survival, etc. So, so it's, it's quite, quite clear that these detections need to be happening um, over timescales of minutes to hours and cannot be over days or, or weeks because um, specifically when it comes to certain uh, species that are highly mobile, um, they, they move over very large areas in very short time periods. So that, that would uh, require to be able to track them over those shorter time periods. Now, um, in this case, the, um, uh, we, need, um, we need a low number of fouls detection that's beneficial, but we need to know that we don't lose or miss encounters. Next slide. Uh, I will be uh, specifically looking at um, the southern resident killer whale detection and tracking needs here. A, it's an endangered population in our waters, but also there's a lot of effort that has been focused on that specific um, population. It's not because killer whales are the only important animal there is. Um, uh, actually, southern resident killer whales are one of 10 or 11 populations in the North Pacific. Uh, so the, it is, there is a lot of, uh, um, they're, they're at high risk, there's a, a low number of animals and uh, there's a lot of effort in terms of monitoring these particular whales. Now, when, when we look at the, um, the, the actual distribution of these animals, we know that, that they have a, a fairly large range, overall range that goes from all the way up in uh, the northern border of, of um, Canada to, uh, with Alaska, all the way down to California, um, in, 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 which seems to be have, might have been historically one of the, a very important feeding area as well. Now, within Canada and the US, we have certain areas that are um, designated critical habitat areas, which mostly originally were within the Salish Sea, that uh, includes waters of Juan de Fuca Strait to the west, uh, the Strait of Georgia to the north and central part and the Puget Sound in, in US waters. In recent years, Canada has added a critical habitat area off the west coast of Vancouver Island, uh, extending it onto two banks, uh, Swiftshire Bank and La Perouse Bank. And I'll get into that a little bit more in detail. Uh, these areas are actually quite important. Um, now, um, originally, the, the most of the, the information that was gathered about uh, the species came, of course, from, from visual sightings. And based on visual sightings, you get a specific picture of, of density um, uh, distribution, which is shown in, in the right here. And uh, that, that density, um, density um, distribution is, of course, based on the probability with which you actually can see those whales. Now, you, you notice that, that there's different ellipses with different colors here. And that, that those, those uh, different colors sort of 
um, uh, indicate the uh, the amount of effort that was spent within uh, within each of those areas. The green ellipse shows the most uh, sightings effort because there's more more uh, vessels on the water, more observers. There's absolutely more sightings uh, in the in the brown area. Brown ellipse it's sort of a low to medium effort because there's fewer. Um, uh, effort, fewer sightings, and then in the red area you have very, very little effort. Next slide. Now, um, the the main tool uh, used to monitor, or not, it's not the only tool, but one of the main tools to monitor uh, uh, resident killer whale um, or other whale um, movements and detections uh, is through shore cabled um, systems. And when you look at the distribution of shore cables, and I have missed, of course, a lot, there's probably more and there have been more in the past, but uh, there are quite, that's one of the, 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 um, the primary tools used to track um, killer whales. In, um, in, uh, I, I listed five organizations here that actually have an, um, Look at um, uh, shore cable or operate shore cable systems. Uh, DFO has its um, fisheries management has its own. There's, uh, there's NGOs like Saturna, Orca Sound Network in the U.S., which um, which um, uh, Scott and and Val uh, will probably talk more about. Uh, JASCO has an underwater listening station in in the middle of uh, the shipping lane, and Ocean Network Canada has also some. Now again, when you see that the effort is concentrated within that green circle here. Uh, there's most of those stations are in this one area, but when you be looking at the actual uh, distribution, we see that 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 is quite um, quite wider, and and uh, in the lower part that that square shows you where uh, where ships are actually moving through and and um, and could be potentially an, an issue for them. Uh, next next slide. Uh, the different PAM systems, other than shore cabled ones, um, the shore cabled on the left, are uh, buoys, uh, different types of buoys that we're also testing as, as real time um, detection tools in our area. And they are spe specifically for those areas where we can um, put shore cable systems in place because shore cable systems are a, uh, hard to install, um, difficult, costly, especially when they're further offshore and when they're in deeper water. And uh, the losing the system um, would be hard then to replace and it's high in cost. Next slide. Uh, just uh, to give you a little bit of an idea of, of the acoustics and self, um, killer whale calls uh, have um, a wide range of uh, frequencies and have features within them that, that allows us to, to uh, identify different groups very easily, but at the same time, um, they have also overlap in their frequency contours with a lot of other species, for example, humpback whales and um, uh, white-sided dolphins, for example, which makes it harder for detectors and classifiers to determine uh, who, who is actually calling. Next slide. Or, uh, just go through those, yeah. Um, so I can't go without talking about the detection limits. Uh, the detection limit is given by that that we 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 have to assess what the call source levels is over those frequencies, what the propagation is at the middle part here in in a uh, particular area, how the propagation of those signals change between winter and summer, and what's the noise level, and that's on the right hand side in that particular location. Next slide. Now, I, here it gives you a quick example of what it means to look at uh, propagation and, and how that affects our detect detection ability of, of, of killer whales. Um, and the top one, you have the actual signal of a sequence of calls from southern resident killer whales. Uh, at uh, in the middle, the, that same sequence at a distance of 270 meters. And then at uh, the bottom, uh, the same at a 520 meter distance. And you can see that the signals are not, they're, they're, they're uh, dissipate fairly quickly. And especially that when you have a noise signature over top of it, that causes um, a detection problem with that. And you would have to look at different frequencies and different types of signals. Now, 
killer whales have obviously uh, developed uh, um, uh, systems to avoid some noise, but um, um, but uh, detectors have to actually look at these differences within the signal and the propagation of those signals to determine. Another one is on the left side showing that the signals are not propagating the same way depending on where the whale is and how the whale is vocalizing. If you vocalize this towards uh, a receiver, it's on the left side, it's, an, it's a call from northern residents, or whether it's away, the, the actual spectrographic representation is quite different. Next slide. This is just showing you at a particular location how the detection range changes, but um, we can skip that over and go to the next one. And just to give you a few uh, take home messages about what we need uh, in terms of um, detection, uh, real time detection means, uh, we, we need more efficient and reliable detectors um, for all PAM efforts in general. Uh, the, the detector performance settings need to be based on the specific objective. So we have to work, uh, they ha the, the settings have to be flexible enough so that we can adjust them to the specific needs. In some cases, uh, low missed call rates may be required for studies that um, uh, allow us to determine whether a species is there or not. At the same time, or at a different, uh, for a different need, uh, low false alarm, alarm rates uh, are important, especially when it comes to risk mitigation. A clear understanding of detector performance and limitations is needed. Often is uh, presented uh, in a way that, um, or the, the, the detector classifier can work but we don't know whether it works in every region the same way we have to have good understanding as what are the limitations uh, of location specific time specific uh, and how and species specific we need higher classifier accuracy to differentiate between species because that's one of the biggest limitations that we're facing that uh, similar costs or that costs from different species may be similar and can be confused uh, and that noise signatures, for example, vessel noise signatures can also uh, confuse the classifier. So, and last not least, I want to know everybody that we're talking about acoustics here. Uh, whales don't always call. And that's one of those things that, that we have to keep in mind. Uh, they can be quiet and can be quiet for very long periods of time. And that for specific needs that we have in terms of mitigation, uh, um, mitigations risk, uh, that that is um, that that limits um, the ability of using acoustic detections, and that's all. I think I was over time already, so to stop here. Thanks, Harold. Thanks, Hillary, uh, for this really interesting presentation. Thanks for making time to be here today uh, and uh, and sticking uh, almost to the time schedule. Um, we have time for one or two questions now before we move on. And there's already one in the chat, so maybe we could start with that and then see if there's one more question before we, we move on to the next speaker. Um, and that was for you, Hilary, uh, from uh, John uh, Maloney. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Do you see it? So it says, uh, Hilary, I know that historically these glider buoys uh, systems focus on baleen whales and then John is curious whether uh, they're about their capabilities to also look for higher frequency vocalizations uh, so I think that kind of ties the two presentations <laughs> together yeah that's certainly that's going to be really important on the west coast where there's a lot of pressure um, to do real-time monitoring for killer whales uh, I would arg also argue and, and John knows this that uh, I am more of a beaked whale person. Um, beaked whales are tooth whales that uh, click at very high frequencies, much higher than killer whales actually. And um, I think there is a need to have systems that are able to do real time monitoring of these higher vocalizing species. And maybe Dougal will touch on this as well. Um, but you know, when there's military activities or loud noise producing activities far offshore of Nova Scotia where these beaked whale occurs, um, it would be good to have systems in place that can monitor an area before these activities occur, or maybe while these activities are occurring. Um, so I still see a need for high frequency real time um, detections of tooth whales here on the East Coast, even though there's a lot of pressure right now to have those systems in place more so on the West Coast. 
Yeah, and, and uh, just to, to add to that, um, we're actually in the process of trying to get a, a glider uh, equipped with a with a detector system that would allow uh, detection of odontocetes, but we don't know whether we're going to get it. So we'll have to wait until we actually have it, but hopefully that will happen sometime this year, and then we'll test it off the West Coast. And uh, just to answer John's question, he you are totally right. I don't know how you got that, but yeah, they are. They look very suspiciously Irish. Those 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 three um, buoys that that I put out there. Dougal, you're not going to be talking about uh, gliders today. <laughs> I guess we'll have to hear what he's going to be talking about. <laughs> Thanks for uh, addressing these questions, Hillary and Harold. I think uh, I'm actually going to move on, move us on to the next speaker, just in the interest of time. Um, so next up is Adam Como from the Coastal Environment Observation Technology and Research Group at Dalhousie, um, who will talk about um, gliders. Adam. Great. Thanks, Oliver. I will try to share my screen here. Is that coming through fine? Yeah, looks good. Great. So thanks for being here, everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about the hydrophone systems on a couple of different autonomous platforms that we use at the Sea Otter Glider Group. Um, the Sea Otter Group is funded by lots of different partners, the Ocean Tracking Network, the Ocean Frontier Institute, MEOPAR, the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network, um, DFO, um, AMERA, and, and several others. Uh, I manage the Glider Group, and I should uh, put a big caveat in there. I am not an expert in machine learning or in hydrophones, but I've been working with these gliders for uh, quite a while. So we use these glide we use gliders to you know track and monitor animals. These can be done with acoustic telemetry, where we put um, pink, where researchers put acoustic tags in fish that are then picked up. Well, as they move and migrate by receivers, whether and some of these receivers can be put on gliders or subsea floats. The gliders can also be used for acoustic data offload to get data from these um, seafloor moored receivers. Um, the gliders can be used to collect oceanographic data in the water column, such as you know zooplankton for understanding animal habitat. And then they can, of course, you can put hydrophones on these gliders and listen for ocean sounds, such as marine animals. And this is just uh, a kind of a schematic of some of the sensors that we use on the gliders. The, you know, it can be everything from ocean physics, ocean chemistry, and all the way up the food chain. I won't get into details about this now because it's not the focus of this talk, but feel free to talk to me about it afterwards. So the glider group, at a glance, we started in 2010 with a small group and we've worked our way up to uh, seven slocum gliders and four wave gliders. We've done 120 odd missions, mostly off the coast of the Northwest Atlantic, some off of the, in the Pacific Ocean. Um, we've traveled 82,000 kilometers with our gliders. That's about uh, two times around the world. And we'll have our party right after COVID is over. Um, and you can find more about our, our program at seaotter.oceanadella.ca. So a little bit about our gliders. Slocum gliders are buoyancy driven uh, platforms um, and they have a fixed battery and can be put into in the water for weeks to months at a time, depending on the battery type. Um, they can be flown year round, um, there's troubles with ice, of course, but there's even some workarounds for that too. We use them to study, uh, or we use them in conjunction with research partners to study for North Atlantic right whales, um, perform environmental monitoring, uh, tracking acoustically tagged animals, and even gathering sound velocity measurements for parties of interest. Here's kind of a, just a quick video of what a glider looks like to provide some context. These machines are small, 
Um, they're able to be deployed off of a small boat. When they're in the water, they can travel to whatever study site they, and travel, you know, hundreds of kilometers, um, even thousands of kilometers in certain cases. And they're slow. They move about uh, a kilometer an hour or half a knot. Uh, the wave glider is another platform that we use and this is a surface platform that's solar powered and wave driven um, when these can go out for you know since it takes its energy from the environment it can go out for um, months at a time several months and it's really limited by solar angle and solar strength and biofouling of course when something breaks down that's another thing but uh, yeah we use these gliders to also track acoustically tagged animals, um, like I mentioned before, to offload data from Seymour mounted receivers. Um, and we can monitor aspects of the environment, whether it's um, the air temperature and wind, because there's MET stations, that it's, it stays at the surface. Uh, wave height, we can measure near surface, ocean temperature and salinity, oxygen concentration, stuff like that. Uh, and it can be used as a sensor test bed. There's a pretty generic computer on here uh, that can be used uh, to in integrate new sensors. Um, and this is just a little image or a, a GIF of the wave glider moving throughout the water. Like I said, it's wave driven and it actually uses the difference in wave energy from the surface to several meters below the surface to, to create thrust to drive it. And these platforms are, are generally robust. They can survive um, waves of over 10 meters and, and 50 knot winds, or they have survived that. And the Sea Otter Glider Group deploys gliders for researchers. And the um, an important uh, research or uh, an important program that we've helped recently is the Miopar Whale Project, uh, spearheaded by Dr. Chris Taggart and Dr. Kim, Kim Davies. Uh, these hydrophone missions had slocum gliders equipped with DMONS. These are, the acronym stands for Digital Acoustic Monitoring Instrument. It's an instrument des developed by Mark Baumgartner at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And it's able to listen for, uh, record audio recordings and um, perform real-time analysis on that data to report back several different species of whales. Uh, in our configuration, we've got them set to record up to a kilohertz and, and report back on, on five different species of baleen whales. We've performed missions uh, mostly off the Scotian, she Scotian Shelf and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, as Hillary mentioned uh, earlier, these gliders generally uh, report back every four hours. And they'll report their real-time detections and pitch tracks used for validation uh, whenever the glider's at the surface. And then that data are validated uh, by humans um, and uploaded to whale map. And then these um, detections can move on to whale managers to dynamically adjust fishing season and pose speed restrictions to protect the species. This is just to highlight um, a successful year, one of our successful years. Uh, in 2018, in the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence, we deployed three slocum gliders for an equivalent of 319 glider days. This is, you know, three gliders out for one day would be three glider days. This isn't in the same scope as Hillary's 3,000 uh, hydrophone days per year, but, you know, we're working towards it. And while these gliders were out from June to December, they were reporting back on you know, real-time whale detections from, I just shown here four different um, species uh, grabbed from the whale map website. And then all the red dots, as Hillary had mentioned, uh, are validated acoustic detections. We've done other hydrophone missions with the gliders, including um, a mission with a wave glider equipped with a Ocean Sonics IC Listen. This is more of a test. And in the first year, uh, the system failed, and but recorded some useful data for a short amount of time. And in the second year, um, a large data set was collected, and we, I think it was realized that there was a lot of platform noise made, despite our best efforts at noise abatement. Um, 
now, but I think there could still be some work done in, in that to, to improve the, the system. I'll get into a little bit of that later. We've collaborated with JASCO for a North Atlantic right whale mission where they had a glider deployed in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And I'm sure Katie will talk a little bit about that in the next talk. And in November, we also deployed a JASCO observer just a set to record high, high frequency audio data um, for a test mission off of Halifax. And that data is available to whoever wants it. So when you want to record ocean sounds, uh, you don't want the platform that you put your hydrophone on to make a lot of noise. So I, I thought that it's important to talk about, you know, how to minimize these sounds and you can do it by mission specific parameters, such as telling your machine not to run noisy systems, such as a CTD pump or, you know, duty cycle it, not to run a, a little propeller, uh, a rudder, or only move your engine at certain times. There's speed control that can be done as well, where you limit the rate of descent of a slocum glider so that it's not in cruising down the, the water column, um, you know, generating all kinds of turbulence and, and other noise. And these can be set in our emission parameters and are governed by pilots. There's also a physical setup that can be done to quiet down the operation where there's hardware improvements. Um, I know rudders, there, there's been new improvements over the years and the new ones are much quieter than the old ones for slocum gliders and wave gliders. You can reduce the drag by putting better um, hydrodynamic um, sensors or modifications on your machine. There can be sound dampening devices like rubber pads or Teflon. Um, there's some debate of whether or not these works, but I, I'm sure they don't hurt. You can minimize ocean surface interference by towing your hydrophone deep below or behind your machine. Um, this gets it away from ocean waves slapping over the surface of the wave glider. And other hydrophone placement considerations can be made such as in the nose, uh, on the wings, dorsally or in the aft. And there's trade-offs between these mounting placements, whether it's sensor safety, uh, noise, turbulence, weight or balance. And each, each placement or consideration um, should be you know, tuned to the specific needs of the researchers. This is an example of a slocum glider with a demon mounted in the nose. You can see there's an aluminum frame that we call the spine um, that it's attached to to aid with physical attachment. Um, the new Demon 2 is actually integrated dorsally into the middle science bay of the glider. Um, this is more convenient for use. For use. Uh, this is an example of the JASCO observer on a dorsal mount. You can see that there's a white plastic shield around the hydrophone and this certainly helps for protection and uh, it's easy to use and, and, and mount. This is an example of the observer hydrophone kind of just breaching the ocean surface while on mission. It's important to note that that white baffling can help protect it and that for uh, when you're performing audio analysis on this data that you're going to get some weird sounds while the glider's at the surface between, you know, dunking in and out of the water and such. So, for considerations with regard to machine learning, and again, I'm not a machine learning person, but in terms of the platform that's operating these things, um, you generally want a low power uh, system. I mean, with slocum gliders, as soon as they go in the water, they have a fixed battery life and anything that takes from that reduces the length of the mission. For example, uh, one having an instrument that runs at one watt will reduce your battery life by about 30% since the glider itself runs at about three watts. Um, the wave glider, since it does solar charging, it's a little different. It's not limited uh, in the same way, but more of, um, you know, if you have a, a system that uses many watts, it reduces the capacity for other sensors to operate simultaneously. And if you want to operate your system in more northerly latitudes or in the late fall and winter, 
you, you want it to consume much less than five watts because you're going to be into real power constraints. And I think certain applications uh, could benefit from having either a high or low power mode re recording, you know, high frequency da um, audio data or low frequency data to save power uh, and to be able to be turned on and off for dynamic management. It would be a key feature. There's data bandwidth issues. I mean, when these gliders are at sea, predominantly they communicate over iridium, which is slow. Um, typical data transfer rates on Slocum gliders are about seven megabytes a day. Um, the wave glider has the ability to do cellular communications when it's near shore uh, to offer much faster data transfer rates. So that could be something worth considering. And the computational power of the platform. Um, old systems are slow and I don't think it could run anything further than what they currently do, but newer systems such as the computer on the wave glider um, might not de need dedicated hardware. It's got a pretty fast computer with some extra bandwidth that might be able to be tapped into to save power. So just looking into the future, the Sea Otter Glider Group um, plans on performing more missions with hydrophones with North Atlantic, and we're in talks with Transport Canada for more North Atlantic right whale monitoring missions. Uh, we plan on deploying the glider in the Southern Gulf of St. Lawrence for UNB researchers, Kim Davies and her group. Uh, and we're in the talks of working with DND for ambient noise measurements uh, for some of their missions. And, you know, being a, a glider expert, I. I commenting on the future of hydrophones on AUVs, I might be a little misplaced, but I think it's safe to say that some of the uh, requirements would be a low powered system, sophisticated, sophisticated noise filtering um, algorithms, especially for noise wave gliders and directional, directional information of detections, you know, pointing it, getting a bearing of where that sound came from. I know that research already exists, but in terms of a commercial product that's easy to use, um, it, it would be really good, I think. And just to sum up um, some of the conclusions that were brought up on by the course organizers, um, I provided examples of the current work with um, that utilizes these, cap cap these, these capabilities with the whale missions. Um, Hillary's mentioned how important it was for real-time in situ analysis uh, of hydrophone data. I won't go into any further detail on that. Um, we've identified the, some of the main technical power constraints by saying, you know, these gliders that we use are limited, have limited power budgets and transmission bandwidths. They, they're slow and slow machines. And then, you know, for the end user, I think having a low power system, something that's accurate with no to low false positives, as Harold was mentioning, um, and be small, lightweight and streamlined. And um, a special thanks to everybody. Um, I'm just one, per, one member of the Sea Otter Glider Group. There's lots of other people that come together to make this happen, including, you know, Kim Davies and Hanson, Chris Taggart and all their people, but not just them, a whole a host of other people. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Adam. Uh... Thanks for this super in, informative talk. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting and useful information in here for, for those who uh, are trying to develop dedicated hardware and software uh, for processing acoustic data on, uh, on these autonomous platforms. Um, also, thanks for bringing us back onto uh, the time schedule. Um, we have time for one or two questions now, if, if anyone has questions for Adam. And as I mentioned initially, you can either, you can ask questions by unmuting yourself or uh, you can uh, use the chat. I've got one quick one. This is Scott down in Seattle. Go ahead, Scott. Um, I, I know that wave gliders are used for listening to humpbacks out in Hawaii. And once I visited uh, the west side of uh, the Kona coast and saw a little bit of the vibration damping they use, um, when listening to humpbacks. I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit more about the, the noise issues you experienced on the wave glider? And is that wave glider the same as what was born of those, um, the Jupiter Foundation in Hawaii or is it your own engineering product? 
It's not our own engineered product. We worked with the Woods Hole uh, folks with Mark Baumgartner's group who has done noise abatement with wave gliders. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe through him, it's the same people, but we got our pointers directly from Mark Baumgartner and uh, one of his colleagues. Uh, I know that we've put sound dampening devices whenever we've got uh, metal hitting each other. Uh, we've put rubber pads and Teflon pads and where the wing stops um, hit other metal, we put um, stoppers on there. Um, they kind of wore out throughout the mission, so I don't know how well they are long term. Um, but there's also the rudder on these older generation. This was the SV2 wave glider, and the rudder would make a lot of noise. I mean, and co completely overwhelmed the audio signal. Um, I'm, it's my understanding that the new SV3 gl gliders with their improved rudder uh, make a lot less, lo less noise. Um, so I'm really interested in getting an audio record with these new wave gliders to see um, what kind of improvement they can offer. Great. So it's mostly mechanical noise. I, 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 my understanding was that the Hawaiian group, which is the Jupiter Foundation, and I think they, they then became a, a, a for-profit company, <clears throat> were mostly having uh, you know, wave surge flow noise issues. And um, so what I saw were vibrational dampen, dampening on a lowered cable well below the, 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 um, the wing stops and the rudder and all of that mechanical platform. Yeah, we, we did some form of, you know, flow noise abatement where we had this um, cellophane kind of wrapped hydrophone with um, a mesh around it to, to help with flow noise. Um, we towed it directly underneath, similar to what you're saying, underneath the sub. Uh, other researchers have, or groups have talked about um, having a neutrally buoyant, you know, towed line that just goes behind the system instead of below. Um, and the, having a neutrally buoyant system that's towed behind, I think would help with you know, the system going up and down, um, but we haven't tried that yet. Thank you. We'll look forward to putting one of those off the Washington coast at some point. Cool. Okay, thanks again, Adam. Um, I think we'll go to the next talk, uh, which uh, will be given by Katie Kowarski of uh, JASCO, um, and uh, her talk is entitled Near Real-Time Acoustic Monitoring from Gliders, Practical Challenges, and System, uh, system Development. So please, uh, Katie. All right. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so thanks, Oliver. Um, so I'm with JASCO Applied Sciences, uh, where my primary role is acoustic analysis um, of acoustic data for marine mammal occurrence. Um, and today I'm going to give an overview of JASCO's experience with near real-time acoustic monitoring from gliders. And this is based on a trial in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in 2018. Throughout this talk, I'm going to focus on the challenges we faced and the methods we applied to minimize them. Um, and many of these themes have been touched on by some of the previous speakers, which is awesome. And I'll, I'll expand on some of them that uh, we really tried to address in our program. Um, so this work is recorded in detail in a paper that came out last year, and I want to highlight that though I'm presenting today, this is the outcome of efforts of many of my co-authors, and this project was a collaboration between JASCO, Teledyne Web, and the Ocean Tracking Network, as well as many others who helped us along the way. So to start from the beginning, I'm saying a bit more context for anyone who isn't aware, this was touched on a bit by the previous presenters, um, but one of the big drivers for why we undertook this work and why we needed real-time information from gliders um, was driven by the events of 2017 when there was a North Atlantic right whale mortality event in Canadian waters. Um, and in one season, 12 right whales or 2% of the population um, were lost. 
Sorry, I was just told that I've been quiet. Can everyone hear me? Um, yeah, I think you've come through uh, fine. Okay, thanks. So the cause of death for many of these whales was ship strikes or entanglement. Um, and additionally, I want to point out that 13 other baleen whales were lost that same season in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, including blue minke and fin whales, though their cause of death was not determined. So in response, the government put in place these mitigation measures that were mentioned by some of the colleagues on this call, including vessel slowdown zones and fishery restrictions. And it was this concept of dynamic mitigation measures that meant that stakeholders needed to know where the whales were in real time. Um, a substantial program to attempt to monitor whales using aerial surveys was deployed, but this method is expensive and it's only effective in specific conditions such as daylight. So underwater oceanic gliders offer an opportunity to report on acoustically active marine mammal occurrence in near real time. Right whales produce a number of vocalizations and two types are considered fairly reliable species identifiers and are produced regularly. The up call and the gunshot. And to the right, we have an image of our monitoring setup where a silicon glider had a hydrophone mounted on the top. So after the 2017 right whale mortality event, JASCO and its collaborators started developing a system to monitor right whales and other baleen whales in near real time. This real-time monitoring system was trialed in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in September of 2018, when the glider transited, transited northward from the 15th to 25th of September, which you can see in the center figure, and southward from the 26th to 30th of September on, in the figure on the right. And after the trial, the real-time monitoring system was evaluated and refined to be more effective. We then re-simulated the trial with our updated system and once again evaluated how effectively we could report on baleen whale occurrence. And for the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to walk through the challenges we encountered during system development and refinement. I'll go through the approaches we took to mitigate these problems and the performance of the final system before discussing some of the work still to be done to make this type of monitoring more effective. So for those who aren't aware, JASCO has a long history of designing acoustic recording equipment for autonomous, often long-term deployments, where autonomous multi-channel acoustic recorders are deployed on or near the seafloor. And these systems are then collected and the data analyzed for species occurrence post-retrieval. And I think it can help to put the challenges of near real-time monitoring from gliders in perspective by placing them in the context of challenges faced during post-retrieval acoustic data analysis. So first, when determining if a species is acoustically present, there is a challenge that different species can have overlapping acoustic repertoires. And this is a challenge both for real-time and post-retrieval analysis. So as an example, we have two upsweeping moans which on their own, one may assume both are right whale upcalls um, if you base it on our previous example. But if we zoom out in the spectrogram, we can clearly see that the top one is actually part of a humpback whale song and the bottom is a right whale upcall. And here is the first time I'm hitting on a theme um, that any analyst will tell you is important in identifying species and that's context. You can almost never tell a species from a single vocalization. You need to know what else is happening around it in the acoustic recording. The next challenge is differentiating signals of dance from anthropogenic sounds, which is a challenge both for real-time and post-retrieval analysis. Here we have two different signals that could easily be mistaken at first glance by either a human analyst or automated methods. The top spectrogram is seismic activity from oil and gas exploration. The bottom is right whale gunshots. 
So how does an analyst differentiate these? Well, we listen to them. These two sounds can sound quite different depending how close they are to the recorder. And also, of course, context. One is occurring in a mechanical pattern, another is not. Another challenge for both real-time and post retrieval analysis is interpreting faint or masked signals. Unfortunately, whales don't always vocalize near the recorder or sometimes they're vocalizing in noisy regions, making it hard to make them out. For example, has anyone spotted the right whale up call in this spectrogram? Given only that faint signal that could be missed by a human or an automated detector, I would not be confident it was a right whale. But in the context of the gunshots that are on either side of it, even a faint signal can be assigned to a species. And this brings us to our next challenge um, and why many of you are here today, and that's developing, developing effective automated detectors to support analysis. Certainly a challenge regardless of how the data are collected. Here we have a series of right whale up calls that have been manually annotated by a human analyst. And this type of analysis can be arduous and time consuming. And though there is inevitably some bias between analysts, it is still largely considered the benchmark of reliable truth data in acoustics. So below is the same series of upcalls, but with an automated detector run on it. Many of the upcalls were captured, some were missed, and a few were incorrectly detected. Of course, the benefit being these were run extremely quickly. Automation has come a long way, but there have yet to be baleen whale automated detectors that are considered sufficiently reliable to accept the results without some level of human validation. The next challenge is power and storage constraints, a challenge faced by both systems. This is arguably a greater constraint for a glider that would suffer from the weight requirements of extra batteries, whereas something like a bottom mounted system could simply have more battery packs added. Similarly, self noise. All acoustic moorings have to mitigate and plan appropriately to reduce self noise. But this is especially challenging for a moving system and Adam went into all of these challenges and things to take in consideration in some detail. And now we're getting to what we found to be the real crux of the problem. Um, and that's that the glider can only transmit information to shore when it is at the surface. And generally this is through Iridium satellite connection which results in a limited recorder to shore transmission budget. This limitation means that no raw acoustic data or very little is ever making it to shore in real time. Rather, we're depending on the output of automated detectors on a system that can have limited computational capacity. So when it comes to marine mammal analysis from gliders in your real time as an analyst, you need to up overcome all of the challenges I've already discussed and confidently determine which species are acoustically present without access to raw acoustic data. Instead of acoustic data, glider analysis in real time has previously been completed using pitch tracks. It's essentially the center line of an automated contour detector. The tracks are sent to shore, drawn onto something resembling a spectrogram and provided to an analyst for interpretation. But these can be hard to interpret. Are these lines all that occurred during that time frame? Are there humpback singing? Is there glider noise? Did the glider run out of budget before it could transmit more information? We can't simply listen to it or look throughout the recording to find out. So now I'm gonna start going through how we went about managing these challenges. When it came to developing automated detectors, dealing with power and storage constraints and computational capacity, we managed this by using some of JASCO's newer technology, the Ocean Observer. The Ocean Observer hardware, seen here in the top right, was fixed within the glider science bay and was connected to a hydrophone mounted on the top of the glider. The Ocean Observer ran within a jet uh, within a Java virtual machine that operated within a Linux operating system. 
And this environment allowed hardware independent algorithms and software to run directly on the embedded platform. And on our trial, it ran 11 automated detectors with eight distinct FFT configurations while recording acoustic data continuously at sampling rates of both 512 and 16 kilohertz. Um, the acoustic data can be stored on up to four 512 gigabyte SD cards for post retrieval analysis. The power draw was about two to three watts and based on the performance in the trial, we estimate that with an extended slogan battery pack, the system could achieve a 100 day mission. The Ocean Observer was integrated with the glider's mission computer, allowing it to send messages to the computer that could subsequently be transmitted to shore via the glider's uh, iridium, iridium telemetry hardware. Our goal was to use this computationally powerful technology to address the re remainder of the challenges by identifying and prioritizing important acoustic events and providing enough context for confident species detection by a human analyst on shore. I'm going to give a very broad overview of our process and leave out a lot of details for the sake of time. But if anything is unclear, please feel free to ask myself or one of my colleagues about it afterwards. So our first step was to develop automated detectors for baleen whale vocalization detection. We used our contour following detectors built with JASCO's PanLab software. We had previously had success using these detectors on acoustic data post retrieval. So we built off the technology we already had for the purpose of glider analysis. Our goal here was to detect all acoustic signals, be they self-induced glider noise, sounds from nearby vessels, baleen whales or pinnipeds. What we wanted to capture with these detectors was context. As I stated earlier, um, when we're doing post-retrieval analysis, automated detectors can be great to direct an, al an analyst to a period of interest, and then the analyst can use all of the context within the acoustic recording to determine what species are present. In contrast, here, analysts don't have the acoustic data. They're only working with the automated detectors. So we need those detections to capture the context. In the end, we employed 11 automated detectors. Some were species specific, for example, built to detect a right whale up call, while others were general detectors built to capture all acoustic signals. The limited glider to shore bandwidth, which in this case was about eight kilobytes per hour, not only prevents the transfer of raw acoustic data, but it also limits how many automated detections can be transferred. So our goal was to develop a method to identify important times in the acoustic data and send all of the detections in that time frame to shore. This was done by assigning each automated detection a priority ranking. So for example, in this trial, capturing right well signals was really important. So right well detection might be assigned a high ranking of say five. The next important is the endangered blue whale. So those detections are assigned a four, while fin whales would get a three and all of the general detectors get a one. As an example, here's a schematic of a spectrogram. We have blue whale vocalizations in blue, thin whales in green, and right whales in red. As the observer records acoustic data and automated detectors are run, a sliding window moves through the data and identifies the period with the highest ranking. So in this example, it would capture the period with right, fin, and blue whales. This group of detections is called an ensemble and all detections in the ensemble would be selected to be sent to the glider computer. The sliding window would then move to the next highest strength ensemble, and if there's room in the transfer budget, that would be sent as well. And the process continues, always sending as much information as the budget allows. Ensembles continue to get sent to the glider computer until that um, hourly budget is maxed. And then when the glider surfaces, which in our case was about every three hours, the ensembles were sent to shore in order of ranking. These ensembles went to Teledyne Web's shore infrastructure to a database where they were then emailed to analysts. And on the left here is an example of what the analysts receive in an email. It's a picture of the detections drawn onto a frequency and time clock. 
each detection was given a different color, which you can see in a legend at the top. And on the right is the associated spectrogram that was made once the data were recovered. Um, and you can see instead of pitch tracks, we actually have the option of doing contours. So these capture the entire shape of the signal to make it as close to resembling the spectrogram as possible. And we found this approach uh, really helped us to identify more impulsive sounds and to help separate glider noise from whale vocalizations. And once an analyst received an email, they would follow a protocol document to determine whether a species was positively detected or not. Um, and this document was essentially a series of decision trees that reduces the bias across analysts. And then the analyst results um, would be fed into whale map, which has already been described by some of the, the um, presenters today. And um, here I wanna bring your attention to some good examples of why context is so important. So if you look at the lower example for minke whale, you'll see there was actually um, a false right whale upcall detection. And this is from the right whale upcall three detector, which is our most inclusive right whale detector and allows in the most false detections. Uh, if an analyst was given only the pitch track of that one call with no other context, um, this call may be assigned to a right whale. But given the contour and the full shape of the detection, along with the context of all the pulses in the series, our protocol would guide the analyst towards indicating that right whales were absent from this time frame, while minke whales may be present. And if I look at one more example here, um, for a couple different types of detections, uh, if you look at the lower image, you can see that we have a blue whale audible call detection. And again, on its own, one might incorrectly think it was a blue whale, but add in the harmonics above and below that was captured by our general detectors, along with the very strangely shaped right whale three detection, and our protocol would lead the analysts to assigning this period as glider noise. After all of our development and system refinement, here is the performance of the system through that short trial. Post retrieval, we analyzed the recorded data in its entirety and compared those truth results to the near real time results. For each species and call type here, I have provided the precision, which is the P and the recall or R. And for, as, as Harold said, uh, which one you wanna optimize is really project dependent. And for this project, we were tasked with achieving as high a precision as possible, uh, which certainly may not be the goal for all programs. And you can see here, the cost to a high P is an inconsistent R. The system performance unsurprisingly vary depending on the time frame you look at, which should always be considered when developing these systems and understanding which time frame is important for practical purposes. For example, in real time, the shortest time frame possible is really by dive. So optimizing performance at anything shorter than that would be impractical. Or if stakeholders only view the results and implement mitigation measures daily, then optimizing by day may be the best goal. So in summary, there are many challenges to identifying marine mammal vocalizations in passive acoustic monitoring. And these are only exacerbated by near real time monitoring techniques from gliders where there is no access to raw acoustic data while the glider is at sea. Our approach was to use technology with high computational and storage capacity to identify and prioritize important acoustic events and then send enough context to shore for confident species detection by a human analyst. Um, I think we still have a long way to go and there's lots of areas where systems like these can be improved um, some of these have already been touched on today. Of course, uh, in this example, we would love to increase our recall, but as it stands, there will always be missed signals because we are always only looking at the portion of information that can be sent to shore. Further, it's always going to be a challenge to capture faint signal when relying solely on automation. We're currently exploring other technologies, um, some of these have been described by Adam, that spend more time at the surface allowing for more consistent transmission, such as um, this unmanned surface vehicle here. Another way to increase recall is waste 
less transmission budget on false detections. So we're developing uh, directional systems, which can result in more reliable automated detectors. We're also um, implementing onboard noise notifications to ensure less noise periods get sent to shore. And as Adam said, uh, noise in general is an issue with moving platforms and any research and development introducing that is, would also always be helpful. Our power draw would allow for a 100 day mission, but work needs to be done to reduce this power requirement for anything longer. Or as in this unmanned service vehicle um, could have a platform that gains power while at sea. And when it comes to machine learning, um, I think it would be really interesting if neural networks could incorporate um, these important parameters like context that's uh, so crucial to confidently identifying different species. Um, so again, here's the paper. If anyone would like a much more detailed description of this project, um, thank you for your time. And thank you Meridian for organizing this today and inviting me. Um, there are a number of co-authors of mine on this call. Um, so we'd be happy to take any of the questions or feedback you may have. Thanks, Katie. Uh, this was a really interesting tour of your uh, near real-time uh, acoustic monitoring system. Um, and uh, it's, it's really interesting for people like us who develop algorithms uh, to uh, get this insight into how, how they're used. Um, and one thing I gathered, for instance, is that having a detection algorithm that um, not only detects, but actually uh, is able to um, uh, draw sort of the contour around the cause is it would be an important component of your your pipeline. Um, so, so this is very useful for us to know as, as we continue to develop these algorithms. Um, we have time for, for a few questions before uh, the break. Um, there's been a bit of a discussion going on in the chat uh, between Hillary and John, but I think John was able to answer most of Hillary's questions. Um, but we'll give, uh, we'll give people a few moments in case there are other questions for, for Katie. Katie, one of the questions was about, um, uh, have, we de have we used Observer from other platforms? Why don't you talk for just two seconds about what you're doing with open ocean robotics right now? Sure. Uh, so John's referring to the unmanned service vehicle that I put up at the end there. Um, so that's kind of closer to being like a wave ladder and that, that it stays at the surface. It's a vehicle that moves um, electrically, electrically through the water. And so we've been doing tests with them, um, towing a hydrophone, um, just, just as a, as a towed array. So, so it's, it's nice. I would say just comparing some at analysis from both vehicles. Um, it is nice, at least in calm conditions, having the hydrophone so separated from the system. Um, whereas the glider, it was right attached to it. Um, when you run into those glider noises, I know Adam gave a really detailed list, but really every little click of the glider you can record. So, so being a bit separated was nice. Um, but yeah, we've just started looking at some small amounts of data from different types of vehicles. Okay, thanks, Katie. I don't see any other questions, so I think we can um, move on to the the short break. Um, and we're five minutes behind schedule here, so um, I'll suggest that we reconvene here in uh, in um, in ten minutes uh, at uh, thirty five minutes past the hour. So that would be three thirty five here in. Um, in the Atlantic time zone, uh, 11.35 on the West Coast. Um, and uh, we will start up then with uh, Fabio Frazau, um, Meridian Deep Learning Developer, who will talk about embedded deep learning. So see you all here again uh, shortly. It's uh, 35 minutes past the hour, so we're ready to 
resume the webinar um, and uh, we'll have <clears throat> now Fabio Fresal, uh, deep learning developer with Meridian, uh, talking, uh, talking about uh, embedded deep learning. And I see that Fabio is, uh, is almost ready with his slides for us here. I think I'm ready, Oliver, thank you. Fabio, could you bring up your volume as well? Uh, yes, just a second. It was just a little faint. Does that help? Much better, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, hi everyone, thank you for being here. I'll talk a bit about uh, embedded deep learning and some of the platforms we can use to bring deep learning based detectors and classifiers uh, closer to the sensors used in underwater acoustics. I'll start with a brief introduction of a deep learning on the edge, followed by an overview of these platforms and uh, a few points on the constraints involved when working with these devices. So many passive acoustic uh, monitoring pipelines look uh, something like this. Uh, uh, we have a sensor collecting data out there in the field, but these data is uh, processed somewhere far from the source, like a, in a research lab or a cloud environment uh, after collection. In edge computing, data processing happens near the source uh, with the processing algorithms embedded into the hardware that goes with the sensor. Um, just like uh, Kate was uh, talking about uh, before the break. Um, but here I'm talking specifically about the deep learning algorithms. So what is deep learning? Well, deep learning is an approach to machine learning and that uses uh, deep neural networks at its core. It is uh, widely used across many different applications these days. Uh, many of which you might come across on a daily basis, like uh, speech recognition and synthesis uh, that you can find on personal assistants like uh, Amazon's Alexa or in your smartphone even, um, or like in translation tools like Google Translator, face recognition and object detection algorithm, like uh, what you find in some social media websites, for example. Um, but the, there's an, a number of uh, cases studies uh, have demonstrated that the, the staple neural networks uh, can be very useful for underwater acoustics. Um, and uh, deep learning has some uh, advantages uh, when compared to more conventional um, algorithms. Uh, one that uh, uh, often uh, is uh, highlighted is that the deep learning systems often um, yield better performance in many tasks. Um, and another very interesting point is that the neural networks can be very plastic, increasing reusability and adaptability to new tasks or environments, which I think is particularly interesting in underwater acoustics. And it's uh, one of my the points I consider uh, more important, and I won't go into details here, but uh, if we have times in the questions, that I, uh, I would be happy to talk more about this. But there are, of course, uh, these advantages. Uh, uh, one of them is that deep learning usually requires more resources in terms of data and computing power, etc. And neural networks are also harder to interpret than simpler algorithms. But whether this is a problem or not, it depends a lot on the application and what you expect from the model, what you want uh, to interpret uh, really. In many cases, it doesn't really make that much difference. Uh, the question is, uh, can we take these algorithms that are running on desktops and clusters of computers um, closer to where the data is collected? Well, yes, for some models and some applications and no for others. Um, and I'll give you an overview of some of the platforms that can be used, used for bringing new networks to the field. And I'll uh, talk a bit about the, the constraints there. Um, 
when people think of, of deep learning, many think of extremely powerful computers like these supercomputers uh, here on, on the picture. And that's usually because it's often said that um, um, these models require a lot of uh, data and resource to train, as I just said, actually. Uh, and that's true, but depending on the kind of model and task, um, you can even train on regular computers. Uh, but in any case, the requirements are a lot lower once the models are trained and uh, ready for use and you just want to run them. Uh, and many can even uh, run on, you know, just your average laptop, on smartphones, and more importantly for this talk, on lower level electronics that can be used in embedded systems. Uh, and now I'll talk about a different, uh, a few different classes of uh, devices that can be used uh, in embedded uh, uh, PAM systems. And uh, it will by no means be an ex uh, exhaustive list, but uh, hopefully it will give a good overview for the remaining uh, of um, this webinar. So the first and most uh, accessible class of uh, these devices is that of uh, the small computers. Uh, there are many commercially available there. Uh, the most popular and widely known is probably the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and, and these uh, small computers have pretty much all that your uh, average desktop or laptop has. Uh, it has uh, storage and memory, multi-core CPUs, internet access, uh, USB ports, uh, etc. Uh, they can run a variety of operating systems. Um, Linux distributions are certainly the most popular, but you can even run Windows 10 if you want to. Um, but since these are general purpose devices uh, and they're pretty much the same as regular computers, uh, it's very easy to run deep learning models on them, provided that uh, the model you're trying to run doesn't require more computational resources than what is available on that board. Uh, and often uh, no changes are necessary in terms of software, and you can run exactly the same programs that you're running on your development machine and your desktop uh, on these uh, small computers. But uh, there are, however, a number of uh, processors that are specifically designed to run deep learning models, like uh, Google's uh, Coraline, uh, which is based on their Edge TPU processor. Um, TPU is standing for Tensor Processing Unit. Um, yeah, and the uh, the, these uh, modules, they are optimized to run the kinds of operations that are common in deep learning. And they are available in a variety of uh, forms here that are uh, uh, intended to be easily integrated into hardware that you might develop uh, for your application. But they're also available in more accessible forms like the uh, USB accelerator here that you can just plug it into your laptop or even in one of those small computers uh, that uh, I just mentioned. Uh, they also have a carrier board, uh, which basically houses the module in a device that's very similar in form to the single board computers we discussed before. Um, and yeah, the, this is a very common practice of, among electronics manufacturers. Uh, and they will produce a device like the Edge TPU, but they will also make it available in a carrier board or also called sometimes a developer uh, a board or evaluation board and similar names. And these boards are usually, uh, they usually include the main product, uh, but also add a variety of uh, convenient uh, components for hardware developers to uh, promptly uh, test the, the main product's capabilities. Um, and they are very general and they're not really designed to do any one thing well. Uh, the intention there is that the hardware developer will later go on and design their own hardware around the, 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 the main product there. Uh, but there are many people who will find that the development boards 
and themselves are good enough for their purpose and will never go uh, beyond it and never find the need to develop their own uh, hardware. But it's very good to keep in mind that the manufacturer likely made that uh, uh, carrier board uh, to be using in someone's desk just for testing and development purposes. Uh, so it's worth checking if the specifications uh, match your your intentions. Uh, for example, uh, it might be that uh, they are, were not made to operate in the environmental conditions you have in mind. So it's uh, good to keep that in, uh, in mind. Uh, now going back to deep learning specific processors, Another popular line of uh, modules is uh, NVIDIA's uh, Jetson, uh, which is available in system on module format, like uh, uh, much like the uh, Google Coral uh, TPU. Uh, and they come with everything needed to run a complete operating system on it. It's very similar to your regular computer in, in terms of a user and development experience. Um, NVIDIA also sells uh, carrier boards for prompt evaluation and development. Uh, and in fact, in the next presentation, we'll hear about how Val is using the Jetson Nano at that board, I believe, to, to run his uh, Orca detectors. Um, but now for yet another, another class of devices, I'll talk a bit about uh, microcontrollers. Uh, these are usually uh, manufacture as a, a single chip uh, and uh, they include many of the components you find in the computer like processors, memory, etc. But they are a lot less computationally capable, uh, which makes them consume less energy. So that's often an advantage for embedded systems. Uh, microcontrollers are widely used in devices that require some computing, but that don't need or can't afford a fully fledged computer. Um, so in, in some uh, uh, underwater acoustic applications, uh, that might be the case. Uh, so here are a few examples. Uh, it's very common to find carrier boards or development boards available for uh, pretty much any microcontroller you want to use. Uh, but uh, you can always make your own board if necessary, if that's going to uh, uh, optimize the performance for your use case. Uh, all of these is examples here in this slide are capable to run uh, some deep learning models, uh, but they are certainly a lot more limited in how complex of a model they can run. Uh, so it's, it's very likely that the, just the microcontroller won't do everything that you need. For example, these devices generally don't have an operating system or file system. So if you need uh, um, to uh, compress some audio files or to store them and transmit them, you probably need some extra hardware in your system. Uh, and they also, um, they will also, it, it's also very helpful that uh, you know a bit about uh, electronics and how computer works to take full advantage of them. Um, so because of all these constraints, you, you won't be able to just run the same software you are running on your desktop or, well, or on a Raspberry Pi, for example, there. But there are lots of useful tools out there to help uh, with the software side and help uh, uh, at least uh, convert models to run in these devices. Um, I, for example, develop most of my models using TensorFlow, which is an open source deep learning framework created by Google. Uh, and after you de develop a model with TensorFlow, you can use a TensorFlow Lite, which is a version intended for lighter devices, such as smartphones or small computers. Um, in terms of flow light, we will optimize your model, help you optimize the model and make it suitable for running in such device. And if you're using Google's Edge TPUs, uh, that's the format that they use, for example. But there's also a version uh, of TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, which will optimize the model to be included in microcontroller 
uh, software or firmware, as, uh, as it's also called. Um, but in fact, uh, Catus, which is uh, our deep learning uh, package here at Meridian, uses TensorFlow for its uh, deep learning framework. Uh, and then the next release, we we will include a very straightforward ways to export your model in a variety of uh, formats and for a variety of uh, platforms. But there are similar tools out there to work with models developed in pretty much any framework you like. Uh, it's getting uh, easier and easier to interchange models between frameworks uh, in the direction we are going is such that uh, it really shouldn't matter too much how you develop your model and you should uh, soon be able to use it uh, whatever you want. Uh, so here's another example. Uh, DeepC is another open source project uh, which will convert models created with a variety of frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch and a bunch of others to code that can be used by microcontrollers. Uh, it does that largely thanks to Onyx, which is a standard for neural network specification that's often used as an intermediate uh, format. And finally, I wanted to mention that many of the manufacturers who produce electronic devices like uh, microcontrollers, they also offer their own software stack. So ST Microelectronics, for example, uh, offers software that uh, not only will take models uh, that were developed in, in using a variety of uh, frameworks and uh, convert them and, and, and uh, into a format that can be uh, use it uh, in in the, the software that goes into the microcontroller, but it does does so um, in a way that optimizes the model performance for their specific hardware. Uh, so if you are using their devices, it's a good idea to use their tools because you probably gain performance without really doing much extra work, and that's but similar for other manufacturers too. So it's always nice to, you know, have a look around and see what tools they are offering. Um, yeah, but of course that the running deep learning models on smaller devices uh, comes with all sorts of uh, constraints. Uh, and different devices will impose different limitations. Um, it's very hard to talk precisely about these limitations because a lot will depend on exactly what you're trying to do and uh, how the rest of your system looks like. For example, if you're collecting other data, if you are communicating with other computers, you're transmitting data, etc. But there are a few general points that I think we can make. Um, the first being that the small computers and these deep learning system or modules um, are a lot easier to transition to. They provide environments that are very similar to, you know, your day-to-day -day computers. So you don't need to make too many changes to the software in order to deploy your models on them. Microcontrollers and similar electronic devices are quite different um, because they are so much more limited uh, in terms of uh, computational capabilities you probably leave them with uh, only the key model running task and uh, the main uh, processing task for, say, detection uh, or classification of certain signals. Um, and then you have to add other hardware to perform supporting uh, tasks like compressing and storing data, for example, or you have to communicate with a hardware that already does that. Uh, and the software is also different, so it's helpful if you know a bit about the you know, low-level programming in electronics. And uh, it's, as I said, it's very hard to put actual figures to these points because there are just too many variables involved. But uh, here's some ballpark numbers that, you know, can be taken very roughly. Uh, you know, please don't quote any of these uh, numbers. They're very, very... Uh, roof estimates, but just to position these kinds of uh, uh, devices a, a little bit. Uh, so in small computers, you can expect to find the multi-core processors, uh, 
tens of gigabytes of storage and memory and the power consumption will you know some go three to ten watts commonly you can get higher can get lower if you depending on what you're doing uh, really uh, similarly um, you can get microcontrollers running on hundreds of milliwatts uh, to a couple of watts uh, can be less can be more again depends a lot on what you're doing and uh, how hard you're trying to you know uh, go for efficiency there but uh, you know there there's a, a lot uh, less uh, uh, computational power available there so you you certainly be restricted in the the kinds of models you have uh, it, it's harder to run larger models and uh, you probably have to process a smaller amounts of uh, data at a time so you know as we mentioned as we heard before if you're trying to take a context into consideration it might be harder to do that uh, with uh, smaller models um, so uh, here are some concluding uh, remarks uh, you probably won't be able to run every model in the field uh, but especially if your system can afford a small computer or a system on module like the jetson modules uh, you will be able to run relatively complex models without much trouble um, if you only have enough power to run a microcontroller, then you're much more limited in terms of the kinds of models you can run. But I believe that with some engineering work, you might be able to run simpler models that are already useful for many applications. Definitely not all, but uh, it will depend a lot on what you're trying to do. Um, so in the next uh, talks, we'll see a few more practical use cases, especially uh, valves. So I hope this overview gave you some idea of what is involved in bringing these deep learning models uh, to the field. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, if we have time for questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you, Fabio. Yes, we do have time for one or two questions. and. Uh, um, I'll just direct your attention to the chat because there was actually a question from John, which I think you in part answered uh, with your next to last slide. Mm -hmm. And then uh, building on that, Jim also has a question about um, the hardware specifically being used uh, by Ivan and his team in Rimouski. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll talk to Jim first. Jim, hi. Uh, I believe and uh, uh, it's a Raspberry, Raspberry Pi 3B plus that Ivan is using. I think uh, maybe Ivan is even in this call and some of uh, uh, the people in his team. So please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that's the Raspberry Pi 3B, yeah. Uh, and um, John, hello. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, as I said, I. I find very hard to give some power consumption figures uh, that are general because I think it, you know, it will depend a lot on what that hardware is doing. Um, hopefully those very rough estimates gave you an idea, but uh, I cannot say that they are accurate. Oh, thank you, Ivan. Thank you for confirming. So yes, it is uh, a Raspberry Pi 3 that the Viking boys are running. And if I have still a couple of minutes, I just mentioned that, uh, uh, yes, Ivan and uh, his team, as Hillary mentioned in, in her presentation, uh, they are using a uh, Viking boys in the Gulf of St. Lawrence for monitoring uh, North Atlantic right whales and some other species, I believe. And uh, the last summer uh, we did uh, try to, we did try to, to run uh, deep learning models there. We, we ran the first version on the Raspberry Pi. So it's been, it ran last summer there. And the probe, hopefully we'll have uh, other uh, versions, but uh, yeah, it will be, uh, that, that was one example. And uh, yeah, so yeah, Mark, uh, I think, uh, um, yeah, CNNs, uh, I, I think are fine. I've, 
I'm currently trying to port a small dense net to, uh, to a few microcontrollers. Um, and it's, it's going well. I think, uh, I think it will work, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> It's certainly simpler models, the smaller models are easier to, to work with. Thank you, Fabio. Um, I think we'll, I'll end it here uh, just in the interest of time. And uh, hopefully uh, if the, the conversation can continue in the chat uh, while um, we, we jump to the next presenter, uh, who is uh, Val Vares uh, from Beamreach and Orca Sound. Um, so uh, Val is with us. Uh, on a phone. Um, he uh, lost power, I believe, this morning or overnight due to a uh, storm that impacted uh, San Juan Island where he lives. But Val will be able to give his presentation uh, through the phone, assisted by Scott, uh, who will uh, um, be changing the slides for him, I believe. So please, Val and Scott, uh, take it away. Thank you, Fabio. And uh, just a word to see if. Let's, let's just check to see if you guys can hear me. Scott is going to give the first part of this talk or maybe the whole thing. So just give me a little reading. How do I sound? Yeah, I can give you some feedback on that. It sounds um, worse than when we tested it. Um, getting about 80% intelligibility. So it's sunny down here in Seattle. So um, I'll take the lead and um, do my best to present what is largely Val's experiments for the last nine months. And maybe we'll try to include him, um, if it's all right with you, Oliver, in answering questions. Yes, that, that works. OK, I'll try to go fairly quickly through our slides um, in anticipation of maybe having a little bit more text-based exchange with Val um, if there are questions. So we um, would like to present on computing on the edge of the sea. Uh, Val is at what we call Orca Sound Lab, which is on the western edge of San Juan Island. And part of the reason we're interested in partnering um, with Meridian um, and other Canadian partners is to understand how we might move towards the edge of the continent, which I alluded to earlier. You know, the, in Washington state, we focused mostly on inland hydrophones as we'll talk about today. Um, but there's an outstanding interest in detecting killer whales on the outer coast where critical habitat is, is, uh, be, has been extended and sh that should be announced here in the coming months. So to start off, I wanted to, uh, we wanted to invite you all to collaborate more with us. Um, we've been working pretty hard on machine learning and artificial intelligence for almost 20 years and quite uh, intensely in the last uh, 24 months as machine learning uh, software tools have become more accessible thanks to efforts like Ketos. So at AI for Orcas, uh, U .net, you can find um, brief synopses of uh, some of the projects we've been working on. Um, the last webinar we presented with our Google Summer of Code students, the Orca Active Learning Tool for increasing labels. Um, there's another Microsoft volunteer generated annotation system, which is well-documented and open, open sourced. And this ML on the Edge um, project is something we'll update um, after this talk with more open source code as it evolves. So uh, that's an open invitation to join us um, in trying to build open source software. And the Orca Sound began as a, as a hydrophone network here in Washington state. Um, we've had up to five nodes operating. At the moment, we have three in the, as the map shows. Val is up um, on Orca Sound Lab on San Juan Island. Um, we also have a couple of nodes at the entrance to Puget Sound proper down here. I'm sitting in Seattle. And so when killer whales, southern resident killer whales or, or bigs killer whales come in or out of Puget Sound, these two nodes are, are meant to try to help the visual sighting networks that are, are quite dense in this region up and also up in the San Juans um, track southern residents and other marine mammals. So these are cabled near shore sites generally in less than 10 meters of water, 
often using a dock of convenience to be um, deployed cost effectively. Um, we used to be NOAA funded, but during the Trump administration, we've had to learn how to be lean and mean. And so much of what you'll hear about today is driven by the fact that some of these nodes are still bandwidth limited. Um, Orca Sound Lab is on a DSL line, which has upload bandwidth similar to the upper end of cell phone bandwidths that were mentioned earlier today, something like less than 1.5 megabits per second. Um, I wanna emphasize that Orcasound has become uh, by necessity uh, also an open source software community. So everything that I'm gonna show you, that we'll show you today and everything we've developed in the last couple of years is all open source and in this um, software repository called GitHub. So welcome you to explore those and try to build up upon what we've um, been building both for the underlying infrastructure for streaming audio through this web app um, to try to help humans label data in ideally in synergy with machines, but also um, the code that runs on the Raspberry Pis at each of these locations and generates the, the data stream, both for human listening and for um, what we anticipate will be an increased role for machine learning. Um, so Orca Sound, basically everything above this gray dotted line has been established and tested since uh, mid-2019, and we're actively trying to build these components and enrich them um, down below the line. Um, much of our efforts in the last 18 months have been focused on how do you do real-time inference for Southern resident killer whale calls in the cloud. And um, as of September, we have a, a working system, thanks to an amazing team of Microsoft volunteers who've hacked on this problem for um, the past couple of summers. But what we want to focus on today is um, what we anticipate will be a need for edge computing, um, particularly as we begin adding nodes like the Orca Sound Lab, where they're not on fiber, you're, you are somewhat bandwidth limited, and you may not be able to do um, real-time inference, particularly if you're, you know, we're using PySound um, ADC, which is a hardware that sits on top of the Raspberry Pi 4. And it can digitize up to 192 killer samples per second. So we anticipate um, streaming not only the lossy compressed HLS data for human listening that we're currently using for um, also for machine learning, but eventually um, trying to push up to the, the upper limits of our hydrophone sensitivity and our um, digitization rates to record lossless FLAC files, which would open the door to machine learning um, for those echolocation clicks and um, some of the other odontocy signals that we aren't currently resolving. The other system which we um, are excited about and I think is beginning to interweave with our machine learning efforts is um, called M2 system. It's, it stands for Marine Monitor and it's a, a product of a, a group down in California called Protected Seas. Um, We'll share these slides so you can follow the link, the link and explore each of these. But this is basically a combination of an AS um, logging system, uh, an off-the-shelf radar, and pan tilt zoom camera system. And it ba we're basically using it. This is a tree on Val's Bluff up above where our hydrophone are deployed at Orca Sound Lab, and you can see it has a sort of line of sight um, view of the Harrow Strait in which we can um, not only track AAS vessels, which we had done historically with our students, but also now track non-AAS vessels. And um, that's opening the door to helping us validate which acoustic signals, um, like the ones Katie were talking about, turn out to not be orcas, but happen to be um, some sort of anthropogenic noise from a, a vessel, either a boat um, or a ship. So here's where I was gonna have Val take over. Um, um, and so the rest of this talk is um, really trying to drill down into um, how we're using pieces of this computational network we've been building um, and trying to optimize it for um, experiments with edge detecting. So there's a lot to talk about. Um, this is kind of a, a roadmap that Val built for where he is uh, trying to build his software. Um, but this area in sort of the darker blue is what we're going to focus in on today. So not so much um, the inner workings of the M2 system 
or exactly you know, our, our plans for how to average in time in order to, to get better, um, fewer false positives and um, related to our, our ORCA specific detectors and also um, ways to complement human identification of novel signals um, where machines are doing some averaging to try to help us understand when there is a, a, a new sound that might be a potential false positive, how do we associate it with ships or boats um, versus whales in, um, without so much human supervision? So what we're gonna focus on today is, is not the cloud stuff. Um, you can go back to the webinar recording from the last time to hear what uh, the Microsoft folks have been building for us. Um, but we're gonna to try to zoom in on what can you do with uh, one of the devices that Fabio mentioned, the Jetson Nano, um, leveraging what we've learned um, in the cloud so far. So this is what the Jetson Nano looks like um, on uh, the bench at the Orca Sound Lab. It costs about $99 at the moment and it has a 128 core GPU from NVIDIA. Um, when Val has been trying to push its limits, either digitizing the live stream audio um, in parallel with the Raspberry Pi or calculating PSDs or running these ResNet models we'll talk more deeply about, um, it's generally has not been pushed to the limits. Um, it's four CPUs are running at something like 20% load. Whereas if we try to use the Raspberry Pi to digitize at 192, you know, all four cores on a Raspberry Pi 4 are close to maxed out. Um, with, that's with the Pi Sound um, audio uh, sound, soundboard from Lithuania. Uh, measurements, uh, while the, it's at that sort of load are about seven watts. And um, you know, just everybody should know, I think as Fabio was pointing out that there are other choices and this, was, this device was launched in 2019 about the same time that the Raspberry 4 came out. Val's also been, um, wanted to sing the praises of PyCharm, which is a Python programming um, interactive development environment. So if you are a programmer, this is a little plug for PyCharm. Um, but what we have leveraged um, and we're really excited about is Meridian's um, Ketos package, which as Fabio has pointed out, is, is a convenient front end to TensorFlow and makes you know, experiments with these residual networks um, quite, quite a lot easier for bioacousticians like Val and I. Um, most of what uh, Val has been doing is, is on a Linux laptop, um, but uh, the, the Jetson Nano is being used to, um, once the, the ResNets are trained to, to do some initial tests at, at um, how that device performs in um, what we're aiming for is, is sort of real-time analysis in, in parallel with what's happening through the Microsoft Azure-based um, uh, real-time inference system in the cloud. So the Nano um, is charged with calculating the power spectra um, from the hydro live hydrophone feed and pre-processing spectrograms. Um, and we've got draft code that's not in the repo yet, but um, to ultimately be able to issue notifications. Um, right now, those notifications are just happening between the Nano and the laptop. But the idea is to be able to iterate between the um, generating a new set of predictions with the Nano and then retraining um, and exchanging information, possibly validating with an expert um, right now on the laptop, but someday in a web-based crowdsourced uh, tool. So the spectrogram um, pre-processing, I'll just quickly go over um, to the extent that Val has clarified this for me. Um, you're basically trying to compute power spectral density for um, 130 millisecond windows, focusing on um, 600 to 6,000 hertz, primarily because of um, that's we're focusing on ORCA calls, and that's where the most of the fundamental frequencies and most powerful harmonics are located. And we're doing some normalization, um, also generating a long-term running average of the PSD to reduce the background um, and do some normalization. Um, and then for the purposes of some visual custom Python code that Val has written, 
we're further adjusting the, um, you know, effectively the spectrogram display by taking the square root twice of the PSD values. And effectively what that does is it takes those faint signals that um, um, Katie mentioned and, and amplifies them relative to the stronger, the, the signals that were stronger in the initial display. So here's an example of um, uh, some spectrograms that were generated by this custom code. And um, I guess the, the main point here is that the input for these experiments have been recordings where we know that there are only Southern resident killer whale calls and there are lots of them. So high, we're starting with high density um, signals where we know there aren't any, um, we're not a lot of ships or other sources of potential false positives or other ecotypes of killer whales or whales. So it's a special, um, this is the beginning of a developing a special training set that's very specific to Southern residents and to um, recordings made in Harrow Strait. So we're basically going through a loop to generate these initial labels. Um, and so this, this is you know, yet another tool. It's effectively um, part of what's called active learning. Another, another implementation, I think we have three, three now, um, but they're all aimed at this main goal of trying to increase the amount of labeled data we have. So um, the first step in the script is to generate the spectrograms, um, basically taking the three second window and advancing it one second to try to get combinations of fully captured calls and partially captured calls. And then um, it's displayed as a table, which you can see on the left where um, clearly some of these have harmonic structure in them, others do not. And so the ones that are, um, they're all in, initially labeled call. And so the, the expert or Oracle's job is to go through and um, label the, these ones that are not calls as not calls. So um, yeah, basically you, you select the ones that you wanna label and then you hit no call. So in terms of the neural net development, once you've, um, gone through that development of uh, iterative, uh, iteratively creating training data. That expert labeled data is used to train a ResNet um, using Ketos and TensorFlow. And um, this display now is the same, same type of display, but now you notice that um, there are probabilities um, from the predictions from the model. Um, so zero, is a, is a call and a one is a no call. And in this case, you can see that um, there was a part of a call here. And so the model predicted only, you know, a uh, value of 0.24. So in this case, you know, this starts to raise some of the um, questions about uh, nomenclature and like, what is a call? When does an expert push the call versus no call button? So we could talk a bit more about that in, in the discussion. Um, but in the end, uh, what val has been experiencing um, is it takes about five minutes to label some, something like 1,200 calls. About 10% of the samples need some sort of um, human interaction. And so by iterating on this a few times, we can build up a, a training set that's uh, it's much more fast than just going through manually um, without the help of, of the model. So just to give you a couple examples where we have about 5,000 samples from exclusively Val's efforts to, to label using these new tools. Um, about half of them are calls, the other half no calls. We've only gone through two hours of our you know, highest quality, um, highest density recordings. And so this is a unique label data set compared to the others that Orcasan has generated to date and that there's really only one expert that's been involved in labeling. Um, so ask him all the questions. <laughs> Here's an example of, uh, you know, the, that 0.24 prediction. So any human would categorize that as a call. Um, but what if you only had, your window had only captured the last 10 milliseconds of it? Um, so there's interesting questions on how to, how to label when you're generating these training and test sets. And here's an example of a false positive. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but there's a little bit of high frequency 
tone in there, which may have triggered the, the model. Um, really quickly, I, I can talk more about this, but we're basically using the Jets, Jetson Nano to interrogate the, sound, the soundboard, um, try to get a new array of power spectral density values every three seconds, um, do some integration, basically reducing the um, resolution of that spectrogram down to 100 by 100 element, um, calculating probabilities, and then if um, the probability is greater than 0.5, converting to uh, those values to a PNG image and um, the audio data to a WAV file so that those could be um, reviewed by an expert. Um, I'll leave this for if there's questions. We're basically using the default um, pre-processing parameter values, thanks to Ketos. Um, and where do we go from here? Um, we're a little worried about overfitting, and so we're going to probably generate some more training data before we deploy this on live hydrophone data. Um, but we're eager to try to start the process, which has been really in, um, instructive for the cloud-based um, real-time inference, inference system of using the false positives that are generated over time from the live audio data from a particular location to retrain the neural net to be smarter about that particular location and it's the vagaries of its background noise. Um, and then uh, we need to do a little bit more work on integrating you know, how the Jetson Nano interacts with um, via SFTP with either a web-based um, moderation tool, a validation tool, or one that's based on a, another local computer. All of this is um, both in the cloud and, and on the edge. What we're aiming towards is the ability to, you know, uh, I think as Katie was talking about, improve how efficiently we can analyze the soundscape. Um, so for us, that's, you know, once we've got this machine learning pipeline is established for ORCA calls, we'll move on to other signals like whistles um, and begin the process of um, also using the same model to try to understand um, vessel noise and boat noise and, and how it might be multi-classified. Um, we also are pri privileged to get to listen to harbor seals seasonally and humpbacks in the same environment. So, um, we have interest in those sorts of detectors and classifiers as well. So I'll try to move on to questions now, but just wanted to thank uh, the incredible community of open source community uh, volunteer hackers who've helped pretty much every month or two. We get another infusion of talent from here in Seattle. Uh, COVID has made this a much more uh, national and even international effort. Um, and uh, just thanks to our funders, we're really looking forward to um, working further with on Project Allo with uh, our Canadian colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. And thank you, Scott. You did, you did a great job. I appreciate it, given my limited bandwidth, both uh, electronically and mentally. Excellent. A good example of you being on the edge today. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, and I had one myself actually, Scott. So maybe I'll, I'll just start with that uh, on your, well, uh, and, and maybe this is a question for Val or, uh, or, or you, Scott, or both of you, but on your next to last slide, you were mentioning uh, other um, sources of, of noise, of sound. Um, vessels were one of them. and. It did specifically mention AIS vessels. So these are vessels that would transmit information about their position through AIS. So do you have visions there or ideas for how to integrate the AIS uh, data as a, as a contextual information? Uh, we know there is a ship. Uh, so is, is that something you have uh, in mind? Let me try to, to speak and Oliver, you let me know if this is not making it to the uh, east coast of Canada. So, so far, put so your good. thumb up or thumb down from time to time saying, stop talking, it doesn't work. But in one of those complicated flow diagram pictures, uh, there were three different running averages running across the 
labeled across the bottom of the screen. And my current thinking and is, and I have code, code that's doing this in, in crude ways, is to have maybe in the next step have four of these ResNets running. And one would be doing what Scott described, trying to look at what we call, we can call the real-time spectrograms. And then those other three running averages are going to have maxima that come and go. If a ship comes by, you know, it takes it a half an hour to get loud and get quiet. And so my plan is to sample that um, long-term running average as it increases and reach into the M2 system to get the AIS range speed and bearing for whatever vessels are uh, you know, in sight at that time. And then use that as, use those uh, as the expert to label the, the spectrograms uh, that would come up or, or other measures of, of underwater noise. It doesn't just have to be spectrograms. We could have other detectors there. But anyway, some detectors that are running on a long-term average would be, would, would be getting information from the M2 system in order to build an expert uh, database to train a, a different neural net on ships. And then the same thing happens with the the 30 second time cycle time frame signals where the M2 system picks out photographs, gets ranges. This will take an expert or somebody to correlate the pictures that come in, the ranges that come in with the, the um, peak detector reports. So you, anyway, you get the picture that in some final analysis, there would be four neural networks running in the little Jetson Nano, and one of them would be trying to do the whale detection, and one would be trying to do something with ships, and the other with these sort of one-minute signals, sort of the ship boats passing by, and then the third one, or the fourth one, would be just trying to handle some of the, the short-term signals that show up. This would be waves breaking, um, we get some really cool river otter crunches when they're chewing on stuff and other kind of weird signals. And those would be ones where the, you know, the expert or did, did that come through okay? Still pretty good. Well, yeah. I think, yeah, your answer came through uh, in its entirety. Thank you. So I'm going to suggest, uh, well, maybe uh, as the very last thing, I just also wanted to thank you, Val and Scott, for being some of the first users of our Keta software. It's uh, uh, super useful to have uh, input from, from you uh, and helping us uh, continue the development of this software. So uh, thanks a lot for that. Yeah, but I, let me just interject, Oliver, that we have learned only recently that open source software is not just about writing your own code. It's about documenting it and testing others' code and helping them document it. So um, we're looking forward to uh, that sort of exchange. It's already, already been very fruitful. So thank you for developing it. Thank you, same here. Okay, we will move on to the next uh, presentation, uh, which uh, will be given by, uh, I believe jointly by Dougal Thompson and Jeff uh, uh, McDonnell. Uh, from the uh, Department of National Defense. Um, so uh, please, you're very welcome to start sharing your screen. Uh, just trying to find the right button here. Share screen. That's the one I'd like to share. Uh, just let me know if it's coming in all right. Looks good. Did I get your last name uh, yeah. correctly? Wonderful. Yeah, you did. You. Most most people mess it up, so you, you did well. Just trying to start the slideshow here. All right, everybody see it okay? Looks good. 
Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm Jeff McDonnell, uh, the research officer at the Acoustic Data Analysis Center, and I'll be jointly presenting. I'm going to present the first half of the talk, and then uh, I'll flip it over to Dougal, and he'll uh, share his screen. So it's Major Dougal, Dougal Thompson from the Defense Research and Development Canada. Uh, so our talk is uh, called Defending Intelligently, National Defense's Use Cases for AI and Machine Learning. Um, so just as an outline, uh, these are the, the steps we're going to go through. Introduction to how we use acoustic analysis, because it's a bit different from uh, what most of these talks have been about, but we still we still focus on some of those things as well. Uh, so we focus mostly on anti-submarine warfare, uh, military applications of sonar, We'll go through our uh, problems and issues, um, and then we'll talk about some of the projects that we're working on, and then I'll pass it over to Dougal for his uh, use case. Um, so who we are, um, so I work at the Acoustic Data Analysis Center, ADAC. So we're the Center of Excellence for Acoustic Analysis for D&D. Uh, so we support the military members uh, when in between the Air Force and the Navy. Um, to do analysis, training, and research um, for the military. Uh, and on Dougal's side, he works for DRDC, um, and they work to advance uh, science and technology goals uh, for national defense, um, and specifically the Atlantic Research Center over in Dartmouth, uh, which I know there's some members online. Um, they, focal, they specialize in underwater warfare, and Dougal's actually a transplant. He technically works for the Atlantic Center, but he's actually out on the West Coast. Um, so this uh, slide here uh, shows a bunch of different things, uh, but what you see here uh, is a spectrogram and a couple of the different platforms. So for the military, localization and tracking are the um, kind of the most critical uh, things for us, especially for, in terms of situational awareness for our ships. Um, so to that end, uh, directional sensors are actually very uh, key for underwater warfare. And I know Adam touched on that in his talk earlier. Um, so we use a lot of uh, directional frequency analysis and recording, um, DIFAR, sonoboys. So they're mostly deployed by aircraft, uh, but they can be uh, deployed by ships as well. Um, and the other thing we use are linear toad arrays behind the ships, which were mentioned earlier as well. So those are the two most common sensors that we use. Um, so you can see the uh, tech, the image there, the technician loading a sauna boy, and then below the, uh, I'm not sure how well the GIF is coming through, but you can see uh, an Aurora aircraft dropping one of them. And these things drop into the water, deploy a little parachute, and then the sensor will actually deploy down into the water. And so these have uh, directional capabilities. So um, looking at the spectrogram up above, what you've seen in most of the previous talks as um, the third dimension being intensity. In this case, the third dimension is actually um, direction. So um, what you see on the main spectrogram is a vessel passing by. And then on the image to the right of that, you actually see um, a bearing versus time display. So based on the little color wheel I've got there, we have a vessel passing from east through to west. Um, so you might be familiar with the Lloyd's mirror pattern that you see there, um, but at, what we often focus on is a lot of the stuff, you see those, the solid lines. Oh, the other thing I should mention <laughs> is that the military likes to view these um, with the frequency on the x-axis and time on the y-axis, so it's kind of rotated 90 degrees from what you most be, might be used to seeing. Um, but yeah, so in the lower frequency spectrum there, you see a lot of the solid uh, vertical lines, and those are the tonal components of the uh, machinery from the ship that's passing by. And that's what we actually do a lot of our focusing on. Uh, we, we look at those tonal components and we actually use it as a fingerprint um, for the ship. Um, so we can classify by um, either, you know, surface ship, submarine, or and get down to like different types of submarines, a diesel or a nuclear submarine, and even sometimes down to the individual hull level. Um, the other thing, um, yeah, just to mention that, yeah, the, the directional sensors are more commonly seen in the military, but they are becoming more common in civilian sensors as well with the uh, directional sensors and vector sensors coming down in, in price and availability. Um, so what ADAC does is we actually, we do uh, training for the uh, Navy and Air Force operators to do acoustic analysis. Um, so they do some basic, they do 
on board the platforms like the uh, aircraft and the ships, their their main focus is tracking. So they try and get a contact, usually a submarine, if they gain contact, if they've detected it. Their main focus is just stay in contact and maintain that tracking throughout however long their mission is. If it's a ship, it could be, you know, days, weeks, that 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 type of time frame. Whereas a, an aircraft might they might have a four to eight hour mission at most. Um, and so they basically, when they get back from their mission, they drop off boatloads of food and ADAC and the, um, the post, what we call post-mission analysis, which is um, just the after real time. So we have lots of time, we're well rested and we get to sit down and, and really dig into the data. Um, so next slide here. So this one's a little bit busy as well, but um, it kind of shows the, the different types of sonar. So we use um, both active and passive sonar. So so passive um, passive sonar. So you see a warship there uh, that might have a hull mounted sonar and also a towed array in behind. Um, and so passive sonar would just be listening for a submarine. So you just have your sensors in the passive mode that you're used to, and you hope to detect um, the emitted sound from the platform. Um, active sonar is, uh, it goes monostatic where the source and receiver are co-located. So you, like a hull mounted sonar, you'd set out a ping that you're used to hearing in the movies. And then you get that ping back on the same sensor on the bow. And then you, um, you try and uh, locate the, the target due to using that. And then um, bi-static would be if you sent a ping from the bow and then you detected it on the tail. So then you're getting a specular reflection off the submarine and then you can um, infer different information from that. And then further on is uh, multi-static, which is even a little more complex where you've got multiple sauna boys around um, that have different ones are paying, different ones are receiving. So the geometry is much more complex and that might be um, an area where uh, artificial intelligence um, will be useful for us. And, and one thing I, sh I forgot to mention at the start is that uh, we're actually, you know, we're not really developing AI techniques. We'll, we'll be looking to industry to sort of develop them and we'll be sort of the, the consumers and users of, of the, uh, the techniques once we, uh, once we are able to. Um, so this is what we're trying to avoid. I don't know if the video will come through, but uh, so this is a torpedo exercise that uh, they had an old ship that uh, they had to get rid of, I guess. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I'll move on to some of the issues uh, facing national defense. Um, so if you see in the image below, we've got uh, three different naval platforms. One of them, the top left one is the uh, Canadian surface combatant. That, that one has yet to be built, uh, but that's sort of the, where the future is going. Uh, the middle one there is the Halifax class frigate and the bottom right is a Victoria class submarine. Uh, we also have the Cyclone helicopter on the top left and the Aurora aircraft that was shown before is on the top right. So we have multiple different um, platforms and of course they have sonars that were built by different companies that use proprietary um, formats. So, um, you know, we're often, we're, we're often looking for ways to try and um, analyze these um, more usefully. So for us, that ends up being, you know, we, we take the, the acoustic data out in WAV formats, but we're also looking into um, things that contain more of the non-acoustic data, uh, where we might be able to integrate something like an HDF5 format, where you have some of the metadata uh, included as well. Um, and also, there's we do have uh, the law, we always get, well, sometimes we get good logs, but usually we get logs. Um, and so there, there's data there that can be mined as well um, that can add value to the uh, the acoustic data set. Um, some of the other issues we have, so in detection, classification, localization, and tracking, your DCLT that you've all heard about, um, classification is uh, the piece that's especially difficult for us because a lot of these ships, well, all of these ships that we're trying to track have propulsion-related sources, and Dougal's going to talk about this later on more in detail, um, but essentially if you have a propeller, as it speeds up, you have a, a, a tonal in the low frequency and as the speed increases, that frequency increases. So it, it just adds another level of complexity to your, um, your auto classification algorithms that need to be considered. Um, and so uh, the other thing we're looking at is can, can some of these um, techniques for uh, machine learning be used to queue operators in real time. Like some people are trying to solve, the golden goose would be sort of to have automatic classification work in all situations and you don't need the operator anymore. But 
I don't think we're anywhere near that. Lots of people have tried. And so that uh, what we're looking at is sort of uh, operator assistance where you tell them, say, oh, there's something interesting in this part of the spectrum that maybe you should look at. Um, so, and the other thing we need to think about is how best to uh, organize the data and catalog the data so we can take advantage of these techniques. Um, so some of the um, initiatives that we have going on right now, um, I don't know if anybody's heard of this, IDEAS, it's a Government of Canada um, program, and the link is below there. So we, the, we've actually recently released an IDEAS challenge based on um, artificial intelligence for underwater acoustics. Um, so that one, I think that's already the initial uh, call for proposals is already kind of closed on that one, I believe. So it might be a little late uh, if you're interested, but hopefully some of the folks that are online have uh, at least expressed interest and we'll be reviewing the bids in the next couple of months. So uh, look forward to reading those. Um, other opportunities, uh, I know we talked a lot, the, the, some of the previous presenters talked a lot about uh, the North Atlantic right whales. Um, so we've um, we had a couple of Aurora missions drop sauna boys in the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, in 2018. So Carolyn Binder, who's on the call as well, her and I have been co-supervising. Uh, DRDC hired a student, um, so they were able to, um, we were able to get our student Zach, Zachary Wallet beal who was an honor student and soon to be a master student, and he's been doing a lot of really great work um, on localization um, using those directional sensors that I was talking about before. So we're really looking, um, we've got some pretty exciting results about that. So, so it's not always submarines that are the target. We're, we're also, and I know uh, Dougal may touch on it as well, but DRDC is doing some other um, really great work um, with, I believe with JASCO as well, trying to uh, work with, uh, have a better focus on marine mammals. Um, and the other thing, the other opportunity, I know uh, it's it's a long process to get a hire in uh, in D and D, and Dougal can attest to that because he hired me. Um, so I've been trying to fight to get a, a computer systems developer in at ADAC, and we're hoping that that uh, that comes through in 2021. So that hopefully we'll have that job posted in the next few months. But uh, more to follow on that. But if anybody's interested, you can certainly contact me. Um, so another initiative that we have is uh, the replacement of our National Acoustic Library. So like I said, the uh, Air Force and the Navy all, you know, after their missions, they come by with, you know, gigabytes and terabytes of data for us to do our post analysis on. So we have a kind of antiquated database right now that's a repository for all acoustic data, um, but we'll be replacing that hope hopefully in 2021. Um, when uh, fiscal year rolls over in April, we're hoping to have this one on the street. Um, so historically, it's been sort of the greatest hits collection, um, where it's, we basically only have, keep the closest points of approach, so you have your best, highest signal to noise ratio um, of contact, where, and the rest, anything without contact has been deemed useless, and historically, uh, we've gotten rid of it. But now, um, you know, storage is increasing, but we're also collecting more data, but we're so far, we've been able to manage it. So we're actually retaining all of our data, and especially when we have these sauna boy missions, they're actually quite useful from a machine learning uh, point of view, because there's a great range of sauna, of uh, signal to noise ratio data. So you've got, um, sometimes you may have those great closest points of approach with uh, really high signal to noise, and there may be some other boys that have zero contact at all. So it's really good for training, that can be used for um, training data sets. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to position ourselves to make, um, make ourselves useful in terms of uh, machine learning. So we want to look to industry for solutions on that and try and figure out how to best organize our data and, and figure out maybe there's stuff that we can pull out of it that we uh, haven't even considered yet. Um, so yeah, like I said before, we're kind of looking towards um, rather than just machines doing all the work, machine assisted learnings or machine ass assisted uh, anti-submarine warfare. So um, we wanna cue the operators, um, give them recommendations. Hey, look here. Um, we wanna ease the decision-making process. And because with more and more sensors covering more and more of the frequency range, cause that's the other thing is we've historically, we really look in the below three kilohertz range is where most of our, um, most of our operators are looking and most of our sensors cover only that range. So we're getting um, an upgrade to our warships that's gonna cover a lot more of the frequency range. So we're really gonna look to um, artificial intelligence and machine learning to help our operators from being overwhelmed with having to cover that much more of the frequency spectrum. Um, I believe that's all I had. 
Um, so I'll stop sharing now and pass it over to Dougald. And we'll take some. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I assume everybody can hear me and uh, see my screen. Let me know if I'm making a fool of myself here. Uh, so um, I've been in the Air Force for uh, almost 21 years now as a sensor operator. Uh, and I think for every one of those 21 years, I've been warned of my impending obsolescence uh, as AI uh, comes to save the day and solve the simple problem of uh, passive acoustic DCLT. Um, so I, I think that maybe we're coming to realize that there are some subtleties and challenges to this art that uh, have been overlooked by uh, the futurists among us. Uh, and just like Katie showed earlier today uh, to be the case with whales, um, ship signatures are also pretty context dependent. And that's what I'm going to try to show you today. Um, they can be kind of tough to classify or track without uh, taking account of this dependence. So I can obviously can't show you any of the, uh, the really interesting submarine signatures that we typically work on. Um, but I will show you or try to show you an example of some of the challenges that we run into um, in operations using sonar. Uh, using some unclassified data from uh, DRDC's Northern Watch Array uh, at our Gascoigne Inlet Camp that you see up on your screen here. So um, we've got these two, two uh, bottom-mounted arrays. This is a time series, acoustic time series of the, uh, the spectrogram uh, from one week, from a one-week period in, in 2015. Uh, taken from that, that array um, on the top. And then uh, down on the bottom here, I've just plotted the wind speed and vectors uh, to give you a sense of what kind of background noise those add to the spectrograms. So uh, I assume that most of you probably recognize that each one of these vertical lines represents uh, a ship that's passed. Uh, for most cases, there's also some sonar transmissions mixed in there uh, from some testing we did. Um, and then I've, I've taken the AIS data that we had access to and labeled each of the ship passes uh, what we call the closest point of approach, or the CPA. Um, and so you can see there's a bunch of ship passes, um, and, and over the course of a week, this is about what you'd expect up there, a couple passes per day per ship, um, you know, a couple passes per day of ships. Uh, and so if we were to zoom in in time uh, on four of those uh, CPAs, this is the sort of thing you'd see. Um, so on the left-hand side, the two contacts, Pretty straightforward, not a whole lot changing there. You can see, uh, you can see lots of vertical lines uh, as well as uh, a couple of sort of bigger, more pronounced lines higher in the spectrum. Come back to those in a second. But over on the right, you see it's a little more complex and there's a bit of um, what in signal processing they'd refer to as non-stationarity. Um, so you recognize if you're familiar with DST that non-stationarity uh, will add a layer of complexity because non-stationary processes uh, tend to be difficult to model. Um, so if we take a cl closer look again at our at that uh, week-long spectrogram and just zoom in on two days, um, and again applying the AIS data, you can see that there were two instances of the same ship passing, uh, different days, different times, uh, but the same ship. Uh, and so this is useful for for this um, thought experiment I want to run you through here. Um, one of the things that jumps out to me right away is you can see some of these tonal components bleeding through uh, ahead of the the main broadband. Uh, lobing uh, for, for the first pass, which, which happened to be a closer range. Uh, and then the second pass was a little bit further out. Um, and so the signature obviously lowers signal to noise ratio there. So this is, the, this is the vessel we're looking at. It's the Ocean Endeavor. It's a cruise ship. You know, these, these expedition cruises go up into the Arctic all summer long, carry small groups of passengers, do lots of shore landings on Zodiacs, that sort of thing. Uh, I know this because I had the good fortune of actually traveling aboard this uh, ocean endeavor uh, and doing the circumnavigation of Iceland uh, with my daughter Maisie and, and the rest of my family um, in the summer of 2019 in the before times. Uh, and yes, they do have cute baby life jackets aboard the, uh, the ship. Um, so if you were to zoom in again a little closer in time uh, and just take a look at, at about an hour of the uh, spectral data, you'd, you'd see something like this for the ocean endeavor, right? So the processing parameters up there on the top left. Uh, and the, the thing that jumps out at me right away, well, first of all, you, you can definitely see this Lloyd's mirror pattern in the middle that, that indicates when the, the CPA happened. Uh, but the other thing that jumps out at me is this, um, is the harmonic nature of these tonal components that you see sort of in the middle band between about 60, 150 hertz. Uh, and, and I would assess that this is probably your cylinder firing rate, right? So it's a diesel engine. Uh, each time that, that cylinder compresses, pops, you get, um, you get one of these um, 
you, you get a, a, a cylinder firing uh, rate harmonic. And so in this case, uh, the cylinders are firing at about 3.7 times per second, 3.7 hertz. And so the spacing of these harmonics uh, is 3.7 hertz. It's a four stroke engine. So you get a crankshaft rate of double your cylinder firing rate, in this case, 7.4 hertz. Another thing that jumps out at me here is there seems to be a predominance, particularly on the stern aspect, you know, after the ship has CPA'd this, this uh, hydrophone, um, of every sixth CFR seems to jump out at me. So what that tells me is this is probably a six cylinder ship uh, or six cylinder engine uh, driving the ship. Uh, and so you get an engine firing rate of six times your CFR or about 22 times per second. And that's highlighted with the green, uh, the green squares or the green uh, crosses. Um, the next thing, so that, that that's your sort of engine components, but then there's another component we're interested in. This is your propulsion, right? Your, your shaft, your, your drive shaft and your blades. Uh, and these aren't as apparent in order to, to kind of break the code on this one, uh, you've got to you got to reprocess your data. And again, I'm going to look to this sort of center band in your screen here, 660 to 150 hertz. And I'm going to run what's called a demodulation of noise or demon process on it. Uh, and that brings up, you know, the bottom three and a half, four hertz of this signal. And you see this nice, really obvious line running down here um, at, as it turns out, 2.8 hertz. Now, this is probably your shaft rate. That's the speed you're your um, drive shaft is running at. And you, I know from the open source data that this is a four bladed uh, propeller. So I'm gonna look at four times that shaft rate and I can go back into my main gram and sure enough, there's your, your B1, your first blade line at four times your shaft rate. So that's all pretty simple. Um, you know, everything's kind of stationary, if you will, it doesn't, it doesn't move a whole lot in time. Uh, but if we take, if we zoom out a little further and compare the two dates, so, you know, we've got the first CPA at close range up on the top of your screen, and down the bottom of your screen is the second CPA at longer range. Uh, and and what, it, what jumps out at me right away, looking at this eight, bottom 800 hertz of this gram, is that there's three tonal components that, that are stronger than everything else on your screen, right? And, and two of them, um, seem to change between the two instances, right? On the 30 and 31st of August, these, these two have shifted. Uh, and these two lines line up perfectly with 52 and 75 times your, your crankshaft rate, right? And so the engine has slowed down a little bit between the two days. So these two lines, these harmonics um, are, are showing up. These are probably sort of engine driven auxiliary, something like that. Um, this other line, the red line, this one doesn't move in time. And that I find really interesting. Um, the other two have shifted downwards, but this one stayed put. So that's more evidence of this non-stationarity, right? Um, and it also shows that these, these lines aren't moving all together, right? It's not just a function of how fast the ship is moving. Um, there's something else at play here. Uh, and so what I suspect this is, and, and again, zooming in on these three tonals and reprocessing them using um, a vernier process that I'll describe in a second, um, you can see there's some uh, characteristics of these uh, as well. It's quite interesting. Uh, and what I see here is that is that for the two yellow boxes, you know, your engine related noise, um, these tend to be quite stable. You know, you do see the Doppler shift definitely here, where as the ship passes the buoy, you've got you've got Doppler shift. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, but this, this other line, this one that I've, I've assessed as being shaft related, this one's very unstable. It's, it's shaken all over the place. Um, and that's characteristic of, of something like a gearing mesh rate. So, you know, to go from your engine down to your, uh, to your drive shaft, it goes through a reduction gearbox. And, and so this might be your main gear mesh rate. That's what I would suspect. Um, and so this, these, these, these grams you're looking at here show really good evidence of, of two things. First, the non-stationarity of this, these processes. And second, the Doppler shift, right? Which is another thing you need to contend with because where you happen to be looking at your relative um, location in relation to the, to the ship and its speed is gonna have an impact on, on what you see um, in, the, in the tonals you're interested in. Uh, and, and you can actually gather a lot of information out of that Doppler shift. You can, you can figure out both how fast the ship is going uh, as, as well as how far away it was. Uh, and in the first case, you see it was quite close range, 1.4K. And in the second case, it was much further out, 12 kilometers. But they were doing roughly the same speed, a little bit slower on the second day. Um, and so I, I've written some code um, just as a, as a project that I'm working on to try to track these frequencies, right? Because I, what I'm interested in doing is measuring the source level and the lobing patterns 
um, of those tonal components. And, and in getting there, you know, you run into these issues of having to overcome this non-stationarity issue and, and the dynamics, um, you know, from instance to instance of these detections. Uh, and so the, the approach that I've taken is to first apply what's called a, a vernier process or to you zoom in without having to sacrifice any frequency resolution. Uh, and so here I've, I've shown three examples, you know, 2.5, 12.5 and 50 times zooms from your original sample frequency. And you can see that, that we don't lose a whole lot of uh, granularity and frequency as you zoom in. Once I've zoomed in on the frequency that I'm interested in and I wanna track it. And so for it, at each time step, I'm gonna pick the peak uh, within that, that fixed band that I'm interested in looking at to try to track that frequency. And I'm also gonna look for um, what's the bandwidth because that's of interest to me as well um, and how that changes over time or over, over the angle that you're looking at the ship. Um, and so once I apply this to some real data uh, and, and zoom in on at say this 50 times um, focus, um, I apply this tracking and you can see it performs pretty well, right? It, it tends to just sort of follow the frequency, even though the frequency is kind of unstable, it does pick roughly the center of the frequency all the way along. This is about a thousand data points, so a thousand time steps, uh, but it misses the mark fairly often too, right? Um, you know, you've got these, these dots that are sort of well away from your center frequency that are obviously wrong. Um, and so this is where one, one area that I really see a lot, a lot of promise for AI or machine learning um, to help me or help us in the military solve this problem of being able to track frequencies through a non-stationary process in time. Uh, and that's all I've got. So I'm happy to take any questions, uh, either myself or Jeff, uh, and our contact details are there on the last screen. Jeff, Dougal, thanks both of you for um, the joint presentation here. Um, in, uh, yeah, as usual through the chat or um, or just uh, through the mic. <clears throat> Thanks also for encouraging us to use our neck muscles and <laughs> turn our heads uh, 90 degrees <laughs> the one way and the other. So one thing I was curious about um, uh, is, I guess, so as a general question, the, um, the, the, the Navy's um, uh, sort of stance or, or view on sharing of data, right? Because uh, it, it looks like you have a lot of interesting data, some of it uh, even uh, labeled or already analyzed, uh, which is uh, the, what we um, say uh, uh, machine learning model developers need to make any progress. And so is this something, uh, have, have you had any previous experience with putting data sets out for people to work with? Um, or is this difficult within the, the world that you navigate? So sometimes, for the most part, yes, it is difficult because a lot of the data we actually have is uh, classified. Um, but we are, I've uh, been working with Dougal and Carolyn Binder at DRDC um, talking about that uh, right whale data set that we had our student working on. So that's actually one of the few unclassified data sets. And we have other unclassified data sets as well. But we plan to release that data set. Um, I don't know if I should let the cat out of the bag here, but it's likely to be the uh, data set for the next um, DCLDE workshop. Um, and it'll also be released under the uh, Canadian Open Data um, portal. So yeah, so uh, that'll be coming, I think, by next January, I think that that should be out. So that'll be at least one data set. Um, and yeah, we do want to start working with industry more. So we're looking at uh, determining ways at which we can work at the unclassified level. Wonderful. Uh, that's great to hear. Because um, that's a, a high quality annotated data set is, uh, I think that would be uh, interesting for many of us uh, to get our hands on and uh, Right, and, and Jim Jim pointed out that, uh, yeah, it's, he's right. Uh, it's not the next workshop, but the one after that. So, yeah. So there is, uh, there is one question we could take here in the chat before we move on to the final presentation, uh, which is from uh, Lanfranco, uh, um, who's, who's with ONC um, in Victoria, and he's asking about the algorithm that was used for tracking the harmonics. So that's for you, Dougal. 
Yeah, this was just something that I coded up um, myself just using um, a couple of built-in MATLAB tools, actually. So um, in the DSP toolbox, there's something called um, DSP Zoom. So that's that's how I do the vernier processing. Um, and that, that's pretty powerful. I'm pretty happy with the way that one works. And then to actually lock in on the frequency, um, it's, it's just a pretty simple script with a bunch of sort of filters on it that uses the built-in MATLAB function peaks. Um, which is also a pretty powerful tool that I've been impressed with. Okay, thanks again, both of you, uh, for uh, making time to be here today um, and give your presentations. We um, are running a little bit behind schedule, uh, but um, I see that we still have uh, almost everyone with us. Uh, we were a little over 70 initially, and there's 64 left here so thanks everyone for sticking with us till the end uh, now we will have um jason wood and caitlin pa palmer palmer from smru consulting um, present on machine learning and passive acoustic monitoring application insights uh, so please caitlin or jason uh, whichever one of you is presenting feel free to share your screen now Certainly. Um, so today I will be presenting. Uh, Jason is also located on San Juan Island and is San Power. Um, and unlike Val, he's just suggested I do it. So, ha ha ha. Uh, yeah. So uh, thanks all for, for having us and uh, thanks for hanging out for the last talk of the day. Um, hopefully this will be short. Uh, I'll try to try to cut it off a little bit early. Um, part of the reason I can cut it off a little bit early is uh, Hillary and Harold pretty much covered our first slide for us. Um, so SMRU Consulting is the consulting arm of the commercial arm of SMRU in St. Andrews. Um, we do a lot of uh, work with uh, government and industry. Um, the, the way I see it is Consulting firms such as ourselves and JASCO and industry are really where the rubber meets the road in terms of conservation. All of us are here because we care about conservation and we want the activity, anthropogenic activities to have as minimal negative impacts on marine mammals and uh, other species as possible. And we want to deliver the tools to organizations to construction firms to help them uh, minimize their their takes and whatnot. Um, of course, there's there's various uh, goals to those. Uh, we have obviously um, long-term monitoring programs need uh, higher precision, whereas real-time conservation monitoring uh, programs need uh, high 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 recall in order to avoid uh, shutdowns and or uh, negative impacts. So I'm gonna talk to you today about two of the projects that we've worked on that use machine learning. The first is a collaboration with DFO and the second is an ongoing project with the Department of Energy and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. So the first project is a project with DFO and we are looking to, or the, the goal was to better discriminate between Southern resident killer whales and humpback whales as part of their long-term monitoring projects. So this is again, an area where we need higher precision and recall may not be quite so important. Um, this was a very short project, just two months. Uh, more or less. And the secondary goal was, if possible, we need to discriminate between southern resident killer whales and bigs killer whales. This is, I'm sure, a, a problem for <laughs> familiar with many of you that are in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and the other, the other goal was to have this whatever system be implemented in a system that is they are using to do their long-term monitoring, which is PamGuard. So the data that we used for this came from San Juan Island, uh, just south of where Scott and Val presented from. This is from the Lighthouse Field Station, I believe. 
Um, and, oh, lime kiln. I forget which coast I'm on. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah. Right, so we have uh, 14 days that have humpbacks, uh, excuse me, four, 12 days with humpback recordings, southern reserves and killer whales on 18 and 16 days with big recordings. I just need to move the panel here so I can see the data. Um, and we broke these into acoustic events. So an acoustic event is a period of time when an animal is present and calling, separated by a period of silence. For this, we said if there's a 30 minutes of silence, that's an acoustic event. And then we will extract all of the data, all of the, from that acoustic event. So if an animal is calling for 30 minutes and then there's a period of time, an hour long, we will take all of the minutes in which there were an animal calls. So we have uh, lots of minutes with uh, animal calls from southern resident killer whales, fewer from humpback and fewer still from bigs. And this probably makes sense because bigs are an ecotape that travels in smaller groups. They hunt marine mammals uh, and they don't tend to produce nearly as many calls as uh, southern residents. These data were obtained from data, long-term data sets from 2016 to 2019. So we took those data and we processed them with PAMGARD just as DFO does. PAMGARD is a whole software suite for uh, acoustic data collection and processing. And in the first step, what we do is we run a whistle moan detector. This is a contour tracing algorithm, similar to what we just saw in the last presentation. Um, as you can see, it will get most of the calls, at least some portion of them. It depends, again, on the settings you use, how sensitive they are. Um, we will get multiple harmonics as well, and uh, some calls it misses. So from this, we had about 13,000 humpback whale contours. Those are the blue lines almost 70,000 southern resident contours and 6,000 odd for the bigs. So again, this makes sense. Southern residents are, are local to the population or to the area um, and are quite chatty compared to the other groups. Within PAMGARD, uh, what, there are training algorithms. Uh, you can see them in Gillespie et al. 2012. And the way those training algorithms all work is they break those contours, the blue lines, into contour fragments. And from each fragment, it extracts the mean frequency, the slope of the fragment in hertz per second, and the curvature, so hertz per second squared. It takes those and it clusters them based on one of three, four different um, classification algorithms. So we've got linear discriminant analysis, Mahalanobis distance, random forest, and regression. For this project, we just went with linear discriminant analysis. Uh, this is kind of a, uh, I think it's the most well-tested of the algorithms within PAMGARD and is pretty, pretty straightforward to run. Some of the parameters that you can use, uh, select is how long are the whistle fragments, and then it will do bootstrap analysis, 30 bootstraps, for your whistle contour fragments for each one. So we ran this uh, two ways. First, looking at Southern resident killer whales versus humpback whales. And then the second one we did, Southern resident killer whales, humpback whales, and our bigs detections. So the results from those are presented here. This is a confusion matrix. Um, I suspect most people have seen it, but if you haven't, on the rows of these, Call, uh, matrices, you've got the uh, actual percentage of species in each uh, bin, um, and then in the columns are what percentage was classified. So a perfect detector on the axis would have 100% across the board. Now if we look at our humpback versus southern resident killer whale, we did pretty well. So 100% of our humpback, on average, across 30 bootstraps, 100% of our uh, humpback detections were classified as humpbacks. The southern resident killer whales also quite good on 92% uh, on average were correctly classified as 
Southern residents and 8% were incorrectly classified as humpbacks. When you add bigs into the mix, it gets a little bit messier. Um, this makes sense because A, we had fewer data and B, the data weren't quite so nice. There was a lot more false positives. The calls were more spread out. So you needed to include more minutes of data, which probably don't have calls in them. So again, humpback versus humpback does really well. Humpback only gets confused with bigs here. So 3% of the humpback calls were classified as bigs. Um, southern residents, uh, we get much more confusion between southern residents and bigs. So 77% of the southern residents were correctly classified and really only 55% of the bigs were correctly classified. So this has some potential, but I wouldn't really put too much stock if you were using the second classifier, the, the three class humpback southern resident and bakes classifier in there. So this was the, the quick short results of that two month project. Um, I think given the time frame and the data that we had, we actually got some pretty good results. Um, and what's great is this is built in PamGuard. It's so you can already run it on the data that you collected over the last umpteed odd years, so long as they were processed in a similar way. It was quick, fast, and dirty. Um, again, it was very simple to build and train because all of this is already built into PamGuard. Um, and it also has low computational overhead. So unlike a lot of the neural networks that take GPUs or web services to, to build and train and monitor, um, it's obviously getting quicker, but this requires 30 minutes, maybe, depending on the number of parameters you tell it to check. And then you've got a classifier that you can use on your data. Um, some of the downsides of this is there's really no simple method within PamGuard that I'm aware of. I think, I don't know if Jamie's here or not. He could pro probably correct me to clean out the false positives and or add to your data set. So those contours, you run it and you kind of get what you get. So you need to select your data carefully so that you don't get too many false positives if you're using this method. Um, there's, there's other ways to do this, um, but within a, a quick time frame, this is what we could do. Um, also, PamGuard is open source, uh, but it's open source if you are a Java expert, or you, you can modify it if you're a Java expert, which we currently don't have in-house. So if we were going to tweak anything, we would probably take our data outside of PamGuard and do all the, redo some of the analyses there. So for a small, quick project, we've got something great that integrates with what's already existing, but I'm sure there's, there's many better ways to do um, what we want to do. And the last thing I will add is this is a proper classifier. So a lot of the, the work that we look at now is detection and classification at the same time. You can step through data and say, what's there, what species, what's there, what species. In this approach, we've used a detector that says, get me any contours that are in the region, and then I will classify those for you. So that, that is a quick covering of that project. And the second project I will talk to you about is our collaboration with the Department of Energy and the Maryland uh, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, this is taking our coastal acoustic buoy and modifying it for offshore winds. So kabow! Um, the goal of this project is to monitor a 10 kilometer exclusion zones around pile driving activities for offshore wind development. Uh, this system that we developed needs to be real time and it needs to be cost effective. So with this system, we want to enable um, offshore wind construction companies to take the system and monitor effectively for right whales and affordably. So getting out the, the most accurate system that we can at the lowest possible point. Um, so it's commercially viable. So the approach we've taken with this, because monitoring a 10 kilometer exclusion zone is uh, quite a challenge, um, even for right whales where their propagation range is pretty far. So what we've done is we've taken uh, 
our coastal offshore buoy system and added three hydrophones instead of one. We've put those hydrophones and a lot of the equipment on, the, on a lander on the bottom. And since we have three hydrophones, we can start to get some information about the animal's location. So we've got bearing information at least. So if we put hydrophones or cabal units around the edge of an exclusion zone, if a bearing comes inside that exclusion zone, then we can say, there's an animal here, you please shut down. And if it's outside, then it's not. Of course, you, as you can see, depending on how many instruments and how far away you put them, you can have false positives still, but it's uh, considerably easier than having multiple elements recording and trying to localize using time difference of arrival um, all in real time. So this is the approach we've used. Um, and then for the machine learning aspect, the we have used uh, the right whale detector that I worked on for my postdoc. And we have also, it's a two-stage detector. So again, we're using PamGuard on the instruments to detect possible right whale calls. It will say, okay, there's an edge detector here. We're just using the PamGuard edge detector at a very low threshold. If it detects something, it will make a clip of that, a two second clip and send those two second clips via radio to a base station where we have the neural net processing. So here's a quick uh, picture of the both the lander aspect and the surface expression aspect of the, the cabal units. So on the right, you can see the lander, you can see our, our three hydro, hydrophone element, um, as well as our instrument housings, uh, the uh, hydrophone cables going up to our surface expression. The goal of these uh, was to be more of a short-term solution uh, compared to the Viking uh, instruments. So these are slightly more portable or definitely more portable depending on how you look at it um, than larger systems. They also can't record as long. We don't have um, a solar panel or anything like that. So the batteries do need to be changed. At present, this thing weigh, the cabal units weigh about 900 pounds when deployed in areas where high currents are high um, and less, uh, but we can reduce that based on um, current speed in the area of interest. So now to the, the fun stuff for me, uh, looking at the, the actual network that we used on this instrument. So this is uh, the work that we did for my postdoc. So I'm just gonna talk about it very briefly. Um, so we used a CNN to detect right whales. We used the 2013 uh, workshop data from the DCLDE. That's the detection classification and localization of acoustically active marine mammals um, that typically happens uh, every two years unless there's a global pandemic and then it gets pushed back and no one gets to go to Hawaii. It's very sad. Um, right. So the, the data from the 2013 DCLDE are available online as well as the annotations. It's uh, the training data is consists of seven days and anywhere between 700 and 2000 up calls per day. This training data set is also very nice because you have both right whales and humpbacks calling. So again, this is a, humpbacks make everybody's life more difficult. They, they sound like a lot of different things. So building a classifier on this data set is a, is a good way to test your performance. So we tested a bunch of neural nets. And the other nice thing about this data set is that the results are published. So we can actually do an apples to apples comparison. So the results from the, the participants at the 2013 DCLDE are black on these figures and our neural networks are gray. So as you can see on the precision recall on the left, uh, we, we do very well compared to the, partic the 2013 participants. And again, in false positives per hour versus recall, we're, we're doing pretty well. And what's really important when we're looking at um, real-time or near real-time monitoring is not necessarily to be able to detect 
discriminate between right whales and humpbacks, which is what these data were designed for, but is to be able to detect those very rare calls from animals. Okay, there we go. Okay, how are you doing? Hi. Uh, very rare calls in uh, those long-term data sets. So we actually have um, data from, so we did this with Cornell. We have data from North Carolina, Georgia, and Maryland that we tested this on. And again, the idea was to detect those very rare calls. So in the top above each plot, we show how many calls were in each data set. So Georgia, there was only one call. And it's kind of difficult to see, but if you squint, you can see that our baseline detector that was used in-house in Cornell was not able to detect that one call that was there. So if this were a real-time mitigation problem, then the animal would not be detected. Um, and for the rest of them, again, we compared the neural net trained with uh, lots of data. So the DCLDE data and um, data from other sources and data just from the DCLDE to make a fair comparison. And across all, all data sets, the, uh, the neural networks vastly outperformed the, uh, the baseline one that we were using. So this is really good. It shows that the detector is robust against different uh, areas of the animal's habitat. Um, we were able to actually do an apples to apples comparison. This is kind of one of my bugbears in the field currently is that there's data sets available but everyone tends to publish on their own data set and much of the improvement in the commercial side on the Facebook, the Google are based on publicly available data sets. So if you were to use a, a data set and say you've got the best detector in the world, you need to be able to compare it to something. And so that's why these DCLDE data sets and the results from them are so incredibly important. So this is, this is the uh, detector that we've implemented on the Cabao unit. Uh, see, so the Cabao unit is currently in testing. We had one in the water for the first time just before uh, the holidays. And here's kind of what the base station looks like. So if you were an analyst working on uh, real-time monitoring for uh, right else around, this is what you would see. You can see the bearing here as well as the clips. And uh, yeah, this is kind of happy, awkward scientists uh, being, being on camera. So we've got a playback system right there. That's a hydrophone playing back right whale calls. And uh, yeah. That's, that's that's other team member. So that's that's basically all I have. Um, you know, there there is a huge need in the, in consulting to take the machine learning community's outputs and apply them directly to conservation in cost effective manners. Um, the short turnaround times uh, for a lot of these projects make it really difficult and a very hard sell to say we want to build and train this detector and compare it and run it on all these robust problems to say, yes, this is an excellent detector. We kind of have to use what's already been done. Um, but one of the things I'm really excited about is Ketos and Meridian. The, the packages that they're producing can enable us to train or retrain or even clean up our data a little bit better so that we can again, deliver a, a good product that's going to be ecologically meaningful in our conservation applications. So that's that's about it today. Um, again, Jason sends his apologies for not being able to attend, um, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Caitlin. There are already a couple of questions for you in the chat. Uh, one from John asking about depth capabilities, and Valentina is curious about the data set from LimeKill. I'll let you read them yourself. Oh, you're asking all of the JSON questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's see, the Cabao units currently, they're in the 
30 to 50 meter range, but you need to confirm that um, with Jason. And uh, ooh, the, the lime kiln data sets, they're part of the Whale Museum. Um, I don't want to put uh, any words in anybody's mouth, so I would say ask nicely and probably. Uh, yeah, so, but I, I can't confirm that for you, unfortunately. Uh, you're, you're muted, Oliver. Yeah, I just wanted to point out there was another question in the chat. Oh, did I miss it? it already. Uh, let's see. Uh, Oh, uh, let's see, the PAM guard classification, let's see. Uh, so we're using the, there's the linear discriminant analysis to train. So you can just, uh, if you want, like if you need someone to show you how to just pull it out and then train it and then, yeah, you have to organize your binary files by species and then pick your bootstraps, pick your fragment lengths and just set it going. No problem. And there was a comment, I think, or more of a uh, comment than a question from Yvonne regarding the sort of- the Yeah, the problem with the the is there's, there's no underlying model. They look for a given assemblage of pixels and they're also dependent on training. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so this, this is one of the, the problems with neural networks. Um, there, there's way you can, ways you can pull out different feature patterns um, from the neural networks. Um, one of my colleagues at Cornell is looking at testing them in terms of figuring out which pixels are most important to the neural networks. So he's doing kind of a knockout on the, the pixel end. So to make sure you're not over testing for instrument specific applications, um, which is one of the downsides of the DCLDE data. And our new application is that the hydrophones are all different. So the hydrophones for the DCLDE data were all from Cornell pop-ups. They have their own special features, uh, like every hydrophone system. So that is that is always a concern that you might be introducing features that in learning features that you don't intend for the thing to learn. Thank you, Caitlin. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to end it here. Um, in the um, interest of uh, finishing on time, sort of. Um, so just a final note from myself and uh, the Meridian team. Um, so thanks to all of you who attended today. Um, um, we had a, a super large number of participants, which we are very uh, proud of. Um, more than 70 uh, people participating um, from the beginning and now still more than 50 here at the end. So thanks everyone who joined uh, and thanks of course to the speakers uh, who uh, put in their effort and time to prepare presentations and give their presentations. Uh, it was a, a pleasure to facilitate this really interesting discussion. Um, as I mentioned initially, we've been recording this webinar and we'll make the recording available through our YouTube channel. And um, this will, be uh, uploaded within a week or so, uh, I expect. Um, and so, uh, and, and you can find our YouTube channel through our uh, website at meridian.cs.val.ca or something like that. Maybe Kieran can help me out by throwing the link in the chat. Um, and then as a very final note, uh, we do have another webinar event uh, next Wednesday, which will be on data management for acoustics data. So you're very welcome to join us there. Um, and that's it. So thanks everyone for um, attending and hopefully see some of you next week. <laughs>